Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Torture is my subject this time around. Oh, don't be alarmed. I have no intention of shocking you with unmentionable horrors. For you see, there are all sorts of torments invented by man to bedevil his fellow man, and perhaps the most subtle of these is man's fear of the unknown. We are so constructed, it seems to me, that we can almost always cope with the known whatever it may be. But when we don't know what lies ahead, what nameless nightmare may await, well, uh, let's illustrate with Todd Stearns and his wife, Tammy. Todd, what if you tell them what they want to know? It could mean the end of this country, Tammy. It could mean the end of the world. The world? the world. Mr. X mentioned torture, didn't he? Yes. Will you be able to stand it? I think so, once I know what it is. But Mr. X is clever. He won't tell me. He knows that not knowing, that's the worst torture of all. <laughs> mystery drama, The Pit and the Pendulum, was especially adapted from the Edgar Allan Poe classic for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars Tony Roberts and Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Somebody still cares about quality. To the Budweiser people, that's a lot more than just words. It's a commitment to continue brewing Budweiser the way it's always been brewed. With care, with pride, without compromise. And it's a promise to everyone who enjoys great beer that there's one thing they'll always be able to count on. That one-of-a-kind, Beechwood-aged Budweiser taste. A taste that speaks for itself loud and clear. Hear it talking? 
St. Louis. Time Magazine. What's in it for you this week? Cover story. American Jews and Israel. Without benefit or need of formal treaty, the U.S. and Israel have enjoyed a unique relationship. Without American help, it is unlikely that Israel would have been created. Without U.S. aid and the contributions of American Jews, it would not have survived. But there has been a change in the public atmosphere and diplomatic stance, and Time explores the reasons. In this major study, Time examines the history of America's support of Israel. The role American Jewish groups play in rallying and maintaining that support. And the influences that could bring about further change. Also in time this week, in art, a look at the current epidemic of art thefts with color reproductions of six priceless paintings that have been stolen. In the world, coronation in Kathmandu, complete with jet setters, dignitaries, and 23 elephants. In the sexes, a report on two California women who teach the art of creative submissiveness. Plus reviews of three new books and three new films. This is Time Magazine this week. News you can think about. Talk about. You. Each week throughout the world, more people get their news from Time than from any other single source. Pick up a copy today. It's nothing new to say that men, and women too, have successfully endured the worst of physical pain one can imagine. But mental pain, I'm told, is something else again. Those skilled in the art of extracting information well know that physical force will often succeed. But that mental force will always succeed. Why not employ it at once then? Because it requires great skill, exquisite subtlety, and is, in consequence, far more difficult to use. Be all this as it may, such thoughts held little, if any, interest for Todd and Tammy Stearns as they drove in an official government limousine toward the airport of a large city. You really shouldn't have come to see me off this time, Tammy. Break my record? I've gone to the airport with you every time you've made one of your mysterious, deep, dark, secret trips. Ever since we were married four years ago. Yeah, but with Jill down with a cold... Well, Anna could certainly take care of her for an hour or two. Todd. Yes? You're going to be all right, aren't you? <laughs> what makes you ask a silly question like that? It isn't silly, and you know it. These trips you make abroad every now and then... Well, I don't know what they're all about. I've never known. Because I've never told you, and I never will. The less you know, the better off you'll be. Well, I'm not asking you to tell me. I know you won't. But it's... It's not knowing that makes me bite my nails till you come safely back home. I'm sorry, sweetheart, but I... That's funny. What? I don't think we're... We're not. Driver? Driver, why did you take the left turn? You're heading away from the airport, not toward it. Good heavens, Todd, we are at that. Driver! Driver, answer me. Why? Todd, look. The glass panel's sliding up. What the devil is this? Driver, what in blazes is going on? He's just not paying attention. He's not even turning around. I don't understand this. Driver! Damn it! He's coming for a red light, Todd. Let's get out. And fast. It's locked. Both doors are locked, and I can't open them. Todd. Todd! What does this mean? I don't like to think what it means, Tammy. But I sure wish you hadn't come along this time. Uh-oh. Oh, come in, Mr. Stearns. Come in. Uh, sit down, Mr. Stearns. Make yourself comfortable. What have you done with my wife? Oh, she's safe and comfortable. There's nothing for you to worry about, I assure you. Uh, would you care for a drink? As a matter of fact, I could use one. If it isn't drugged. Drugged? That's a fanciful idea. <laughs> it's no more fanciful than kidnapping me. Who are you? What's this all about? As to who I am, you can call me Mr. X. Oh, Mr. X. Come on, you can't be for real. How corny can you get? It's corny, I admit, but it's also safer. Infinitely safer than any name I might use. You see, X is an unknown quantity. As for what this is all about... Um, oh, your drink. Thanks. What is this all about? 
Oh, come now, Mr. Stern. Todd, if I may. You know what it's about. I'm afraid not. You're lying, of course, but... Well, no sense wasting valuable time fencing with each other, so I'll tell you. I represent a group that's in the business of selling top-secret information of one country to another. You're in the business of conveying top-secret information from this country to another. The reason you were kidnapped and brought here was because we want the top secret you were presently on your way to deliver to... Well, you know where. <laughs> I haven't the slightest idea what you're talking now, about. Now, let's not fence, please. I know that you were on your way abroad with the formula for a new bacterial gas, which would easily tip the balance of power in favor of the country possessing it. Oh, and my government is willing to uh, hand over a weapon as vital and deadly as this to another government? It is, and you know why. The pact between the two governments to keep each other informed and thus hopefully to maintain the balance of power. <laughs> You know, you've been seeing too many James Bond movies. Now, stop it, Todd. I, I I, want the formula, and I mean to have it. Well, you won't get it from me because I haven't got it. As I guess you know, your muscle men searched me thoroughly and found nothing. I didn't expect they would. I'd have been very surprised, indeed shocked, if you'd been carrying such a formula worth untold millions on your person instead of in your head. In my head? Precisely. Todd... I'm authorized to offer you $50,000 for the formula. For a formula you've just told me can be sold for untold millions? Oh, all right. How much do you want? It's an academic question, Mr. Exons. I don't have the formula. Hmm. Would you consider 100000 I haven't got the formula you're talking about. This is a tape recorder. I'm going to leave you here alone for 15 minutes. When I return, I hope you will have been... Sensible enough to record the formula for me. Look, I assure Help you... Help yourself to the liquor. And, of course, you won't try to escape. As you see, there are no windows and only one door. I... And please, please, no more nonsense about your not having the formula. You have it, Todd. You have it as surely as we have your wife. <laughs> Mrs. Stearns, I see you've been made comfortable. What have you done with my husband? Where is now, he? Now, now, there's no need to distress yourself, Mrs. Stearns. Tammy, if I may. Uh, Todd is presently as safe and as comfortable as you are. Oh, I see that you're drinking tea. Would you like another cup? What is all this? Why were we brought here? Please, now, Calm explain. yourself, I beg you. You're in no danger. My husband? Nor is he. He's perfectly safe and unharmed at the moment. At the moment? What do you mean by that? Oh, nothing more nor less than what I said. Uh, tell me, how much do you know about Todd's affairs? His affairs? His work, his career, the duties he performs for our government. Nothing. Except he's an undersecretary. Well, in, in, in some department or other. I don't even know that. That seems rather hard to believe. Married four years and you don't even know what department he works for? No. You never bothered to ask? Well, yes. And? Todd made plain to me he wouldn't tell me and that I was not to ask. Mm. You love Todd, of course. Of course. How much do you love him? I... I love him. I can't say more than that. I think you can. I think you can say a good deal more than that. For instance, do you love him enough to suffer pain for him? A great deal of pain? What kind of question is that? Well, just answer it. Well? I can't answer it. How would I know how much pain I could stand... Until I was standing it. Hmm. Yeah, you have a point. Be interesting, though, wouldn't to find out how much you do love, Todd. How much pain you could endure. I... I don't know why you're threatening me. Threatening you, Tammy? No, no, not at all. Our discussion is purely theoretical. At least at this time. At least at this time. For the present. Well, you're threatening me even now. You're... You're torturing at me by... By hinting at... I... I don't know what. Well, let's hope there'll be no need for you to find out. Uh, come in now, Miss C. Thank you. Uh, stay here with her. You know what to do with her if I send the signal. Do what? What are you going to do to me if he sends the signal? Well, answer me. Please. Please answer me. What? <laughs> tape is blank, Todd. You recorded nothing. There's nothing to record. Nothing. 
If there is a formula such as you speak of, I've never heard of it. Now, why don't you just knock off this nonsense and let me and my wife get out of here? Simply because there is a formula and you carry it in your head and you are going to dictate it into this machine before I'm through with you. And your wife. Tammy has nothing to do with this. Hasn't she? She has only the vaguest idea of what I do at the department, if she has any idea at all. Even if I had memorized a formula, which I haven't, I'd never have told her about it. And why not? Why not? Because your work is precisely what I say it is. Top secret, high security. Uh, no. Then why wouldn't you tell her? You love her, don't you? Of course. Then surely you trust her. Certainly I trust her. But not enough to let her know what you do? Oh, you underrate her, Todd. You really do. That woman would do anything for you. Suffer untold pain for you. What do you mean by that? Suffer untold pain for me. Well, nothing really. She told me she would, that's all. Oh, what amounted to the same thing. It just, just happened to come up in our talk together. When did you talk? Only a few moments ago. I went to see her when I left you. I had a very nice chat with her, very interesting and informative chat. About how much pain she could stand? Well, that was only a small part of what we talked about. Now listen to me. She knows nothing. Of course she doesn't. How could she? There's nothing to know, you say. You harm her. And I warn you, Mr. X, or whatever you are, I warn you... Todd, stop acting like a fool. Now, you know that you're helpless, and so is she. You also know that in one way or another you're going to give me that formula, so... Why not give it to me and save us all a lot of trouble, all three of us? Three of us. You, me, and Tammy. Now, here's the tape recorder. Begin. Very well. Come along with me, Todd. Where to? The cellar. There's something there I want to show you. Something I'm sure will change your mind. <laughs> Tell me what you see. It's a room. It's not a very big room. With aluminum walls. They look like aluminum anyway. What else? There's a hole. Big wide hole in the floor. What else? Nothing that I can see. Look up. <sighs> what do you see now? Hang, hang. From the ceiling. It's about a foot from the ceiling. A, uh, a what, Todd? Looks uh, like a headsman's axe. An oversized headsman's axe with a very sharp cutting edge. Razor sharp. Note how the light gleams off it. And now there's something more for you to see. Tammy. No. You stay here. She stays there on the other side of the room. Tammy, are you all right? Yes, darling. Are you? Sure. Sure. Now, Todd, two questions. Have you ever heard of a torture called a pendulum? Yes, and another called a pit. Is that the hole in the floor? A wide hole? The pit, yes. You have heard of it. You're not going to be sick, are you? No. Todd, don't make me subject you to the pendulum. Especially don't make me subject you to the exquisite torment of the pit. Above all, don't make me subject Tammy to either. No, not Tammy. You... That depends on you. Now, the formula, Todd. Will you give it to me? Or will you not? If you were Todd Stearns, what would you do? Um, if you have the imagination I think you have, you are Todd Stearns, or Tammy Stearns. What would be your answer? What would you do? Think about it until I return for Act Two. Inside your free, inside your free after all, you hear freedom spirit. Like a wild bird calm inside your feet. 
inside your free after all, living free, living free. There's a long stretch of open road before you. You're at the controls of a Buick Century, a really fine mid-sized car. Comfort abounds. A sophisticated suspension system is smoothing the way. An underhood of frugal V6 engine economically goes about its business. You're happy, you're free, and you're in a Buick. Inside you're free. Inside you're free after all. Living free. Living free. Shopping problems? Your better business bureau knows. I'm Inspector Pry, miss. Patience. Miss Patience. According to the report, now you say someone is trying to murder you? Yes, but I was warned. A nice man knocked on the door and told me my brick chimney was about to crash through the roof over my head. Luckily, he's in the business and will repair it tomorrow. This I'll help you, Miss Patience. Who are you? I'm the man from the Better Business Bureau. Be skeptical when a man rings your doorbell and says he just happens to be passing by with his repair equipment and notices that your house needs to be worked on. My stars! I could have been hoodwinked by a scoundrel. It pays to be calm and exercise patience. Patience. Just another friendly tip from your Better Business Bureau. curious room in the basement of an isolated country house, Todd and Tammy Stearns face a torture known as the pit and the pendulum. Face it, but need not undergo it if Todd will tell Mr. X what he wants to know. Reveal the formula he carries in his head for a new weapon of destruction, a bacterial gas. As Todd gazes across the yawning pit at his lovely wife on the other side, Mr. X repeats. Once again, Todd, I know it's a difficult decision, but it is one that you must make. Will you give me the formula or not? I I told you I don't have now, that's it. That's enough. You have the formula. You, you memorized it. I, I know that. So no more time-wasting nonsense. Which is it to be? Will you give me the formula without forcing me to torture it out of you, or must I use force? I, I have nothing to tell you. Perhaps if I explain how the pendulum works. No need for that. I know. But does Tammy know? Do you, Tammy? No. Tammy, look up toward the ceiling. That is a blade, you see, a, a blade shaped like a big headsman's axe, and it's razor sharp. Don't listen to him, Tammy. He's trying to frighten you. Exactly what I'm trying to do, Tammy, for reasons that are quite obvious, I should think. Wouldn't you? Yes. Now, that large razor-sharp blade, Tammy, is attached to a pendulum. A pendulum that swings back and forth and gets an inch lower on each swing. An inch lower on each swing? Yes. And so anyone strapped to that slab on the floor... Look, look down now, Tammy, to the floor. You see the slab with the straps? Yes. Anyone strapped to that slab will, in time, be cut in half. Tammy, don't listen. Slowly. Cut in half slowly, Tammy. You wouldn't. But you, 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 you wouldn't, you please. You can't, you won't kill him. Tom? Oh, gracious, no. He has what I want. I can't kill him unless we reach that perfectly wasteful moment when I have no option but to end this whole scene in death. No, no. No thought of killing him. You. Oh, my God. Tammy, did you hear me? I heard you. Then, my dear, would you try to do what I have failed to do? Convince your husband to give me the formula. But, Tammy... How can I convince him if you couldn't? Todd, have you no imagination whatever? Do you really think that you'll be able to watch Tammy kill before your eyes without breaking? <laughs> no answer. Your silence could signify several possibilities. One, you're too shocked at the prospect to answer... Two, you could watch while your wife is slowly cut in half in agony, Todd. 
Three, you couldn't. A witch, Todd. Possibly even you don't know at this moment. Hmm. Well, all right, I'll give you time to think it over, to talk it over, both of you. Uh, Miss Z, uh, you know where to take Mrs. Stearns. Mr. Stearns and I will join you there shortly. Todd, I love you. And I love you, Tammy. I love you. You love her. We'll see how much very soon now. Very soon. Tammy, glass of champagne. No, it would sicken me. Me too. It just isn't a dinner they've spread before us. It's a gourmet's dream. Or the condemned's last meal. Yeah. Darling, we... We've got to talk this out. What is there to talk out? You told me that the secret, the, the formula that you memorized, if it got into the wrong hands, it could mean the death of millions. And if you give it to Mr. X, it will certainly be in the wrong hands. I, I don't know. Well, what do you mean? The group he represents, they, they'd sell the formula to the highest bidder. They wouldn't care who, just so that they got their millions. Well, maybe for once, just for once, I got to think of us. Not the world. But we are the world. I know that, too. You're involved now. This character X could torture me to death, and... Well, I don't think I'd break. I don't think I would, but... You can't tell till you're going through it. I've known agents who... Well, never mind. To face torture myself alone, that's one thing. But to watch you face it... Tammy, I couldn't bear that. Why are you looking at me like that? You're going to have to bear it, Todd. You can't risk the lives of millions for, for one person, no matter how much you love her. But that's the point I wanted to make. If I give X the form... Todd, you're not going to. It doesn't mean that whoever buys it will use it to control the world. It could simply mean they would have a balance of power with us. Instead of the government... Whichever it is, you won't tell me, that already has a pact with us? Sweetheart, I am just a courier. I'm not up there with the brass. A pact? Well, it's supposed to mean what you think it means, but... Well, sometimes... I don't know. Sometimes I think all it means is that both countries have the same amount of clout and can't rip each other off. How do we get into this? Because this is what it's all about. No. What it's all about is you. You getting tortured is what it's about. Tammy, X is going to make me watch you on that slab as the pendulum comes closer, inch by inch. Darling, I won't be able to bear it. I think you will. I know you will. You're a lot surer than I am. Oh, dear, what a pity. The champagne, the food, you touched nothing. Who is he? Oh, oh, a little quirk of mine. He fits in, don't you think? The black suit, the red hood with slits for eyes. Just right for an executioner. Just right to scare the daylights out of your victims. Exactly. Tammy, are you scared? You better know it. But you needn't be, you know. Not if you had succeeded where I failed. What is Todd's answer now? You better ask Todd that. Todd? No. My answer is still no. What point in it to undergo agony only to give in finally? If one gives in. You think you won't? But you seem to forget. Todd's the one who has to give in. I don't have the formula. If, if there is one. Think now, Tammy, think. You're lying strapped to that slab. That slab beneath the pendulum. You cannot move. Scarcely a muscle moves. You're looking up, staring at... That great blade, it begins to move back and forth, back and forth, swinging and coming lower with each swing. Suddenly, time has sped by unaccountably. Suddenly, there it is, the blade within inches of you now, within an inch, cutting now, cutting through your dress, delicately cutting. And now, now on the next swing, it is going to slice. Stop it! Stop it! Tell me, I can't let you do I didn't this. think that you could. Bring the tape recorder. Don't bother. No. Tammy. Todd, this man is a phony. 
I'll stake my life on it. You're trying to scare Todd into giving you the secret formula. But if your scare fizzles... I won't you... go through with this thing. I won't, hmm? Well, I... I don't think you will. Well, in that case, finish your champagne and we'll proceed. <laughs> One final chance. Mr. X, this is... It's senseless. Makes plenty of sense to me. It would if I were in your shoes. That woman, that lovely, exceptional woman you were lucky enough to marry, lies strapped to the slab. When I give the nod to our red-hooded executioner, he'll press the button that starts the pendulum. Once started, it can't be stopped. Can't be... No. It goes right on, down, and through. Should you change your mind, it had better not be at the last moment. It had better be in time for the executioner to pull her out from under the blade. Tammy! Don't give in, Dot! Don't! You leave me no choice, I must... Do it! Damn it! Damn you! Go on and do it! Very well. I give the nod. on its swing. You see it, Tom? Back. And forth. Back. And forth. An inch lower with each swing. Here. Back. That's the microphone of the tape recorder. Take it. Use it. Tell the formula. What is he saying to you? What is that I've handed you? A microphone? Yes. The mic of the tape recorder. Oh, Todd, don't. You'll die if I don't. Then I'll die. I'm going to die. Me, then a whole world. I can't let you. I can't let you. If you can't let her speak. You've got the mic in your hand. Start talking. No. What's left if I do? What's left? What? She loves me. If I let her down... If I save her life and lose a million others, she'll hate me. What'll be left to me, then? There are other women. You, Sophie. There are no other women. There's only Tammy for me. Oh, my dearest. You are right. We, we've got to go through with this. For them. I've met fools in my time, but you... It's within inches, three at most, from her body. Not two. One. Cutting the dress now. You see? And the next cut. Talk, you fool. Talk fast. The bacterial equation. Oh, God. It's... No. It's... No. What is it? The equation before it's too late. What? What indeed? A man and a woman... Just another man and woman like you, like me, stand ready to sacrifice, or not sacrifice, their own lives for others. Certainly the woman does. The man? I don't know. We'll see. We'll see when I return for Act Three. I want that sinus medicine. Headache tablets? No, sinus medicine. Sinus tablets. Helps the headache and the pressure. Oh, you mean sign off. Exactly. Headache pain is one thing. A sinus headache is something else. Sometimes your whole face can seem to throb with pain. You want relief. Take sign off tablets. S I N E O F F, the sinus medicine that gives you a full dose of pure aspirin plus a sinus drainer. Sign off. The sinus medicine that helps relieve sinus pain while you drain. And Sinoff doesn't stop there. Have you tried Sinoff Sinus Spray, the fastest known form of sinus congestion relief? It works in seconds. That's Sinoff Sinus Spray. When sinus flares up, use Sinoff tablets and spray only as directed. S-I-N-E-O-F-F. Sinoff. Exactly. Sinoff, the sinus medicines in the bright red box. Here's a different kind of a mystery for you. How can you be in three places at once? Well, it's no mystery at Northwest Federal Saving. Every Northwest Federal Saver can be in three places at once 
in all three Northwest Federal Savings Centers. How? Well, the minute you become a Northwest Federal Saver, our computer registers you in all three places. Open your account at any savings center, and you can use any office any time you want to make a deposit, a withdrawal, or to pay utility bills. You can do all this and more in the Northwest Federal Savings Center nearest you. Come visit at Irving Park, Dempster and Des Plaines, or Harlem Irving. It's Northwest Federal's 50th year. Now, the only mystery is how Northwest Federal can make it even easier for you to save. We keep trying 63 hours a week. It's Northwest Federal Savings Time, 63 hours a week. This is WBBM Chicago, News Radio 78. The time 11.04, the temperature 24 degrees at Chicago's Midway Airport. I have said that there are all sorts of torture, limitless degrees of mental and physical torment. And of these, mental anguish is worst of all. There are some who can stand physical pain better than mental, and vice versa. Moments ago, we wondered, would Todd Stearns break under the strain of watching the torment of his wife, Tammy? Would Tammy? Well, let's find out. Todd. Todd. What? You fainted. Fainted? Tammy. I remember now. The pendulum. Blade descending closer and closer, cutting through a dress. Is she... Is she what? Dead! Damn you, is she dead? The tape recorder is right there in front of you. Dictate the formula. Answer me. Is Tammy dead? Dictate the formula. No. You will, if you want the answer to whether your wife is dead or alive. Oh, no. If she's dead, then at least she's safe from you. Ah, but if she's alive... I see it in your eyes, the agony of not knowing. Dictate. No. You've got more guts than I thought. Oh, no. I'm as much a coward as the next man. But you made a mistake. When you left Tammy and me alone together for those few hours. Oh? It's a funny thing, but... I don't know why. Maybe it was just facing our last hours on Earth together, but we really got to know each other for the first time in our four years of marriage. I made a mistake? You made a mistake. You are licked. Dead or alive, Tammy licked you, and dead or alive, I won't let her down. I see. Excuse me. I bring her in. Tammy. Oh, Tammy, thank you. God, you're alive. Oh, darling, oh, darling. Are you all right? right. You aren't harmed. You're all no, right. I'm fine. I'm, I'm, I'm fine. No, you're not. Your hands, I can feel your hands. No, They're I, shaking. I, I, I'll calm down, then I'll be all right. Not if Todd goes on refusing to give me that formula. Biff, you haven't given it to him? No. Oh, I'm so glad, darling. I'm so glad. Your happiness is doomed to a short life. <laughs> Because I assure you, Todd is going to do what I ask. No, not Todd. Oh, yes. Uh, let me say that I, I admire you, both of you. And you have every reason to be proud of this man you married. Well, I am very. But he is not a superman. He has his breaking point, as all men do. I haven't succeeded in reaching that point, that's all. But unless he dictates the formula he carries in his head, I shall take final steps to reach his breaking point and yours quickly. Oh, by the way... Uh, your little girl, Jill. What about her? I thought you'd want to know. Uh, your housekeeper, Anna, sent for the doctor a little while ago. Why? Is she worse? I don't know. All I have is the report that the doctor was sent for. You dirty rat. Now, slowly. Slowly, Todd. Physical violence will get you nowhere. This is part of your next torture, isn't it? Making us worry about Jill's condition. And what will become of her should the two of you meet what you possibly may meet? Death. You leave me no choice but to subject you now to the kind of torment I tried to avoid. Well, there can't be anything worse than the pendulum. There's the pit. I see that you know something about it. I don't know anything about it. Precisely. You've heard of the pit, but it remains an unknown quantity. And it will be that, the simple fact that you don't know what awaits you in the pit, that will break you. 
Just as not knowing why the doctor was called for your daughter has shaken you. Now, once again, will you give me the formula? Then it's the pit, I'm afraid. Back where we started? I don't know. The pendulum, you see, is again in place in the ceiling. I will leave you alone now with just the pit. Oh, and, uh, Todd, when you decide that you can't take any more and agree to give me the formula, just say so. You'll be heard. Oh, I hope Jill's all right. Don't worry, she is. There's no better doctor than Dr. Lynch. Yes, but if the cold's going into her chest, you know, her chest is weak. Don't worry, she... it's just what that louse wants. For all we know, he could be lying. Anna never sent for the doctor. Oh, you're right. I'm doing just what X wants me to do. I'm worrying myself sick. What are you looking for? Something to drop down the pit. Why, what for? Find out how deep it is. Whether the bottom is solid or filled with water. This room's as bare as a bone, though. Here. Oh, your shoe? <laughs> you can buy me another pair when we get out of here. <laughs> I'll buy you a dozen pair. Okay. Here it goes. Funny. I didn't hear a sound. Not a sound. No splash? No thud of the shoe hitting anything? Nothing. A damn thing can't be bottomless. It's either that or awfully, awfully deep. That's for sure. Give me your other shoe. Try again. Yes. The first sound could have been so slight we didn't pick it up. Yes. This time, listen carefully. Very carefully. Ready? Go ahead. I didn't hear a thing. being so near the edge. I don't blame you. The thought of falling in. No. Sorry. It's all right. I feel the same way. Let's sit down on the floor against the wall. All right. Yes, that's better. Todd? Hmm. The wall feels warm. Hmm. It's a little too warm. Just uh, move away a bit. Better? Much. Oh, I'm sure Jill's going to be all right. I'm just not going to worry about her. No. Todd, that wolf's getting hotter. Well, we'll have to move away from it a little more. And closer to the pit. Wait a minute now. You don't think... I hear that. Let me just see how... Todd! Burn my hand. The wall is as hot as an oven. Move over to that one. Well, this one's as hot as the other. It's getting hotter. So that's it. Don't you see? The hotter the walls get, the farther we have to get from them. And the closer to the pit. Until we... Yeah. Until... Are you all right? Oh, darling, she's a knife. And I... We're... Moving closer to the pit. Can't help it. Heat from the wall. Getting worse. Oh, God, hold me. Put your arms around me. Sweetheart. I can't. What is down there? Go over the edge. Less than two feet away now. When we go over, what will happen to us? What? Death, I guess. How? How will we die? Oh, try not to move any closer. Why? Help myself. The heat unbearable. You're moving closer to the edge, too. I can't help it either. Hold me. Hold me. Sweetheart. I guess we... Wait. Wait a minute. What? The heat. It doesn't seem so hot. Not so. 
I think you're right. It's cooler. Oh, the room seems cooler. Oh, let's move back. That won't last long. That creep has got something else in store for us. You see? He didn't go through with it. Just as he didn't go through with the pendulum. No, you fainted. I don't think he would have gone through with it anyway. Why not, Todd? What? Mr. X, Todd. I can see you and hear you. What's given you the sudden idea that I won't go through with things? You want the formula. True. They kill me and the formula dies with me. True. Well. Todd Stern's dead is worth considerable, too. Oh, not as much as the formula, but considerable. I, I, I don't see why. Very simple. It's worth a great deal for a certain government to prevent another from getting the formula. Keeps the balance of power unbalanced, you see. And now that we've settled that, do you still refuse to change your mind? Yes. Todd, I'm sorry to say that this time I believe you. Wait a minute. Tammy has no part in this now. You used her to break me down. You failed. What you use for her is over. Let her go. He hasn't heard you. Or if he did, he said his final word. And I, I wouldn't want out anyhow. If you die, I want to be dead too. But it's senseless. Pointless. I'm the one who has the formula, not you. There's no point in killing you if I... What's that? What is it? Machinery of some kind. But I don't know what it's for. Yes, I do. God, what? The walls. Look at the walls. They're moving. All four of them. Moving inward. Making the room narrower. And narrower until. There'll be no space, no floor space left. Nothing but the pit. Oh, Lord. X! X, listen to me! Let Tammy go! I beg you, let her go! The pit! The wall! Pushing us to it! Oh, let me out! Let me out! Let me Tammy! I can't bear it anymore! I can't bear it! Any more now, sweetheart? No more? Now! More champagne, Tammy? No. Todd? What I want is an explanation of all this, and you better make it a good one, Mr. What is your name? X will do. Yeah, but now we know it was all up. A test or a game or whatever it was. I must still keep my cover. <laughs> Look, I don't blame you for being angry. Simply put, we subjected you to a test to see how much you could take before you broke down. All operatives, couriers, are put through the ringer. I never was before. I never even heard of it before. Never would have if you hadn't reached that point in your career where we felt that you were ready. The formula you so painstakingly memorized, Todd, is worthless. There's no such thing as that bacterial weapon. Oh, no. But if there were, and you were caught by the kind of group I pretended to represent, we had to be sure that you'd never break, never reveal it. And risk blowing my mind. Tammy. No, no, no. You were never in any danger of that. From start to finish, you were carefully monitored by staff psychiatrists. You'd have known instantly if you were in any serious difficulty. Well, I... I guess you have to do it. Yes, we do. Tell me something. What... What did we fall on? I mean, when I went over, holding Tammy in my arms. <laughs> Special foam rubber. Dozens of layers of the stuff. You could have dropped an iron safe down that hole, much less Tammy's shoes, and you'd have heard nothing. Now then, it's over. You can relax and unwind. What's more, Todd? You have gained something that you didn't have before. You've learned how much you can take. And, mister, you can take it. I learned something a lot more important than that, if you ask me. What would that be, Todd? I learned... Tammy, I always thought you were pretty wonderful, but... You're more than that. You're the most wonderful woman... and wife... 
in the world. Truth is stranger than fiction. And if you feel the story I've just brought you is one of the strangest you've ever heard, I can only assure you that even stranger things go on in this world of ours. Stranger and, yes, more terrifying. Let's hope you never find yourself involved with any of them. Beyond your radio, that is. I'll be back shortly. This is Arnold Palmer. In golf, we call someone who plays exceptionally well a champ. And a champ works to win. His whole way of life is geared to that talent. That ability in him which makes him win. Well, that's one way of living. But there are others. And the March of Dimes offers us some of those ways. Ways to work to prevent birth defects. Or ways to help kids born with birth defects. For many of those kids, a way of life is a difficult direction to discover. But for most of us, it's not. By us, I mean young people, middle-aged people, senior citizens, everyone. As honorary national chairman for the March of Dimes, I can tell you that the greatest gift you can give any handicapped child is a little understanding, a little encouragement, and a chance to appreciate life. Won't you help Join the March of Dimes today and find a way of life. Although our version of The Pit and the Pendulum was only based on Edgar Allan Poe's story, it's to this great master of the bizarre and this connoisseur of the horrifying that we owe the stories, shall we say, electrifying moments. I hope you were properly shocked. Our cast included Tony Roberts, Marion Seldes, and Norman Rose. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. This may give you a lift. The morning paper. Page one. Shooting victim succumbs. Joseph Wilson, age 37, died at Mercy Hospital last night as the result of a mysterious bullet wound inflicted while he was driving along the old high road. Wilson, a plumber by trade, leaves a wife, Helen, and two children, ages eight and three. Let me see that. <laughs> well, you have the right. Not many men get to see their own obituaries. Sure gives a man a funny feeling. I'll bet. The victim's will said he will be buried in Clendon Cemetery. <laughs> that policeman sure did it up thoroughly, didn't he? Well, they could scarcely release a story that you died without being nice enough to bury you. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. When I was a little kid, I used to get a magazine every month that had a page of hidden objects, people, or animals to find. Later in life, I had fun with those books where you had to look for the guy wearing glasses and red and white striped clothing amongst a sea of other people. Many mobile games now are centered on finding hidden objects to get to the next level. We humans love searching for lost items and finding them. Maybe that's why we're so fascinated by cryptids like Bigfoot, always hiding, waiting to be found. That's what the book Your Bigfoot Expedition is all about, the perfect gift for the cryptid connoisseur. Be that a friend, family member, or yourself. Dozens of pages of gorgeous, original paintings by artist Timothy Wayne Williams, with a Sasquatch hiding in each and every one of them. Some are more easy to find than others. Some are hidden so well you would swear there wasn't one, but there is. 
Your Bigfoot expedition allows you to travel across the country through all four seasons of the year, from the comfort of your own home. Find the creature in each scene, then challenge others to do the same. The perfect coffee table book for when you have people visiting. Find the book Your Bigfoot Expedition by Timothy Wayne Williams on Amazon or click on the store page at WeirdDarkness.com. This is Boris Karloff speaking. I'm here with a story for you from the files of the Reader's Digest. This is the story of the most versatile of all living substances. It has held man in his cradle. It warmed his hearth. It will make him his last long home. This is the story of wood. When living, a tree sweetens the air where it breathes. It lays the dust and tempers the wind, and when it is felled, sawn and seasoned, it lays bare the hidden beauty of its heart in figures and grains more lovely than the most premeditated design. Touch any object made of wood. The tabletop of bright maple, the chopping bowl of cleanly birch, a paddle wall of knotty pine, the lean strength of an ash rake handle, or a tobacco pipe of briar. Pass your fingers over this wood, then press your full palm upon its firmness. Compared with metal or clay or stone, it still seems warm, still living out its useful days. Wood has gone into the very fiber of our nation. With the thousand and more native species of trees, the United States started out with the greatest forest heritage that ever fell to the lot of a lucky people. Our first exports back to England from the Jamestown colony were from the forest. Mighty pines for masts, pitch, turpentine, black walnut. When British shot fell back harmless from the live oak sides of the frigate Constitution, then she got her name Old Ironsides. And when the backwoods boys fought beside Robert E. Lee and their homespuns died with butternut, they were known as butternuts. The cabin where Lincoln was born was made of the logs of that grand old tree, the American white oak, and the rails that he split were black walnut. Wood fired the racing steamboats on the Mississippi and fed the first railroads. We spanned the treeless plains on ties cut from eastern forests. On rims of hickory and spokes of oak, pioneers rolled west to the Pacific, and there new woods came to hand. Redwoods and Douglas fir 300 feet high, timbers such as man had never seen before. Form and plan are in the very structure of wood from the moment that it begins to grow. It can overcome obstacles, split rocks apart, and travel far in search of water. It can adjust to circumstances. It can endure with an immortality all its own. Wooden piles under the streets of Venice have been found intact after a thousand years, and white cedar in the swamps of eastern Virginia has lain buried an estimated 3,000 years, yet is now being dug up today and sawed into boards that may last another thousand. Say, if you like, that wood has no thoughts and no tongue to speak them, but let him who says this Look into his own heart and produce for us a thought that will warm the hearth of a friend or endure a thousand years. I found the story of trees in a back issue of the Reader's Digest, and there's an article in the current December issue describing a very pleasant way of looking at them, 3,184 miles of them to be exact, all across the American continent. Thousands of people contribute to this journey, an army of maintenance crews, signalmen, dispatchers, electricians, butchers, pastry cooks. For this particular tree-watching device is a veritable super-hotel on wheels. It is, of course, a streamlined train. There's a whole article about the Century and the Super Chief, both top streamliners, in the December Reader's Digest, and it's a fascinating one. I'll be joining you soon for more transcribed stories from the Reader's Digest, past and present. But until then, this is Boris Karloff saying goodbye.
Do you keep a journal or a diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Anne Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write, use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, my friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Mystery House Mystery House, that strange publishing firm owned by Dan and Barbara Glenn, where each new novel is acted out by the Mystery House staff before it is accepted for publication. Mystery House. <laughs> Barbie, I've read the script for tonight's story, and I'd be willing to bet it'll fool the folks. Well, it certainly fooled me. Well, shouldn't you change it then, Mr. Glenn? Change it? Why? Mm. We want to keep folks baffled. Well, with a detective story, I guess that's right. Oh, guess it. I know. Well, people don't want to be fooled about facts, though, Mr. Glenn. They want the absolute truth. I think this is leading up to something, Tom. What absolute truth are you trying to put across tonight? Uh, thanks, Mrs. Glenn. Thanks for the opening. Uh, just listen, and you'll find out. <laughs> Okay, places everybody. Uh, set the scene for tonight's story, will you, Tom? Murder takes practice. Tonight's story opens in the luxuriously furnished study of Fred Ellsworth, an elderly gentleman who has called a private detective to his home. I want you to live right in this house with us, Barton. And if you need more men, get them. Expense is not to be a factor. Understand? Are you sure somebody's trying to murder you, Mr. Ellsworth? You know, murder isn't a very complicated thing. All a killer has to do is kill. I've told you somebody's trying to murder me. You're to accept what I tell you while you're working for me. Okay. But there might be another angle. If anybody wanted to kill you, why wouldn't you be dead by this time? Consider what's happened. First, my great Dane dog dies. The veterinarian performs an autopsy, and the cause of death is arsenic, enough to kill a herd of horses. Well, maybe somebody didn't like the dog. I've always been sort of edgy about those big dogs myself. I'm not a fool, Barton. You think I am? Perhaps I'd better call some other detective agency. Let me show you what I found, or rather what Patty found, in one of the wastebaskets. Who's Patty? My niece. Here. Look at it. Yeah, what is it? Looks like an architect's drawing. Yes, but it's a drawing of my bedroom. Everything in the room marked in. And notice that dotted line from the window to the bed. Another dotted line from the door to the bed. Another from the bath to my bed. What of it? I've been awakened three different mornings by a dried bean hitting my face. A bean shot with some force. And I suspect those beans have come from the three places shown on the diagram. The window, the hall, the bath. Do you see anybody? No. The first time I didn't even look. I was too startled. And I hadn't seen this fool diagram. But if anybody were really trying to kill you... It would have been a bullet, not a bean. Of course, I know that. Anybody would know that. Well, then I don't see what makes you think you're slated for murder. Somebody's practicing, Barton. Practicing? People don't practice on murder. I'm up against a killer who's taking no chances. Who wants to be sure of committing a perfect crime. 
Well, then you must have some idea of who the killer is. Of course I have. It's somebody in my household, naturally. Why do you say naturally? Because there isn't a person in this place I wouldn't suspect of it. Even your niece? She showed me that diagram, certainly. But if you were planning a murder, don't you think it would be rather clever to act like you were helping to prevent it? Well, why should she kill you? Uh, she fancies I've done her some grave injuries, the little fool. Injuries? Like what? Both she and Lucian are wards of mine. Lucian is my late sister's son. Patty is my late brother's daughter. Well, I think they'd be pretty grateful to you for taking them in. But Patty wants control of her money. She wants all kinds of things. She wants to marry a no-good moronic gigolo. Oh, she has money of her own, then. In trust, to be given her at the discretion of a board of which I'm the chairman. Uh-huh. Well, how about the boy, Lucian? He doesn't have a dime of his own and never will have until I die. He's uh, fond of you, is he? He hates me. He feels very much injured because I forced him to take engineering so he can take a place in my organization. Engineering, eh? Huh? Engineers make plans and diagrams, don't they? Yes. Who is it? Terry, I wanted to talk to you. All right, all right, come in. Oh, I didn't know you had anyone with you. Terry, this is Mr. Barton. He's going to stay with us a while. A new butler? That's very nice. This house has been so upset since the last one... No, no, he's not a butler. Mr. Barton's a detective. A detective? But why, I I'm going to find out who killed Nada, Carrie. Oh. But don't you think it was an accident, Cousin Fred? She was such a big dog... Nonsense, Carrie. Dogs don't eat arsenic by accident, not even big dogs. No, I suppose not. Oh, dear, I, I do hope you don't think I'm being rude, Mr. Barton, but... This is going to complicate things. Well, I won't be any bother. At least I'll try not to be, Miss... Uh, Tinley. Miss... Carrie Tinley. Huh. I, uh... Well, I sort of keep house for Cousin Fred. And with the cook leaving... Oh, it... don't act like a martyr, Carrie. She only left two days ago. And if you'd ever get firm with the employment agency... Oh, I was quite insistent, Cousin Fred. But you see, the last cook, Myrtle, told them at the agency why she had left, and well, they won't send any more. Well, we'll discuss that later, Gary. Uh, just a second. Miss Tinley, why did the last cook leave? It's of no consequence, Barton. Yeah, but why did she leave, Miss Tinley? Why? Yeah, that will do, Carrie. Mr. Ellsworth, I'm going to help you. I have to know what's going on here. This doesn't concern you, Barton. I'll see you later, Gary. Yes. Miss Tinley, why did the cook leave? Why... I don't know that I should tell you, Mr. Barton. Listen, Barton, you're working for me and you'll follow my orders. Yeah? Unless I can run things the way I want to, I'm not working for you or anybody else, Mr. Ellsworth. What's all the row? Oh, oh hello, Patty. Your uncle doesn't want Miss Tinley to tell me why the cook left. I should rather think not. Please. The only solution I can think of is for Uncle Fred to do all the cooking himself. Why? He frightens them all out of their wits, insisting that they taste a little of everything in front of him. Patty. You see, he's afraid his food may be poisoned. Oh, is that right, Mr. Ellsworth? I'm not a crank, Barton, regardless of what you think. Well, it's really pretty stupid, Mr. Barton. A month ago, he ate some fish that didn't agree with him. It was poisoned. None of the rest of us suffered any ill effects. No, because none of the rest of you were eating poisoned food. It was aimed at me. A guilty conscience does strange things, Uncle Fred. You think people are trying to kill you because you think deep down in your heart that they have a reason to... Young lady, you can't talk to me like this. Oh, dear. Patty, don't you think that... I think, all right. I think Uncle Fred's riding for a fall. He's played the high-handed dictator with all of us. Patty, you mustn't talk like that. Oh, don't be such a jellyfish, Carrie. He's treated you shamefully. You can't call your soul your own. Why, you could do better working as a housemaid than you do here. His own cousin. You've given the best years of your life looking out for him, and he treats you like so much dirt. You're getting pretty brave, aren't you, Patty? I don't know why I should kowtow to you. I've decided you're never going to let me run my own life anyway. Hi. Hey, where is everybody? In the study, Lucian. Come on. Don't call him in here. Mr. Barton and I were having a private conference. Hey, what is this? A family convention? Oh, pardon me. I don't know you, do I? Uh, this is Mr. Barton, Lucian. He's a detective. Detective? <laughs> Well, what's so funny, Lucian? <laughs> you are, Unky. He thinks somebody's trying to kill him. Yeah. What do you think? Oh, I'm not supposed to think. Nobody else in the house has any right to think. Nobody but Uncle Fred. He does all the thinking. You'd better be careful how you talk, young man. You used to make me believe that, Unky, but not anymore. Nope. You wouldn't toss me out, because then you couldn't control me, and you enjoy it too much. Lucian, please don't uh, upset Cousin Fred, please. Worry, Carrie? Neither one of us needs to worry. You're too good a workhorse to get sacked, and I'm too perfect a puppet. And he's scared anyway, Carrie. Look at him. 
He's lost weight this last month. He's jittery. Why, he... Stop it, you ungrateful little bum. Ungrateful? What am I supposed to be grateful for, Unky? You've never let me do anything I wanted to do. You've tried to make me a carbon copy of you. And when I look at the original... No, no, I'm not grateful. Get out of here. This minute. I'm through with you, understand? Get out. You really mean that, Unky? You bet I mean it. Oh, boy, what a break. I've been trying to get up my courage to this for a long time. And now that it's happened, wow! You ought to try it, Carrie. Lucian, you don't know what you're saying. Ellsworth, you don't really want Lucian to leave. You Don't could... give him a chance to change his mind, Carrie. And by the way, why don't you join me? What? Oh, I don't mean come with me, but why don't you come to life and clear out of here? You'll never find a better time. Get out, Lucian, and be quick about it. Right, Unky. You know, I haven't got a dime in the world and no place to go. I suppose I should be worried. But you know how I feel? Just wonderful. So long, Unky. Well, I wanted to do that for a long time. It's, it's, well, it's a relief having it over. Wasn't very smart, Mr. Ellsworth. Look, Barton, I won't have anyone telling you. You got me telling you right now. Just suppose Lucian is the one who's trying to murder you because he hates you. Then I'm rid of him. He knows this house like a book. And if he hated you enough to want to kill you before, how does he feel now? get so upset, dear. You must learn to control yourself, Patty. Oh, you'd be better off if you didn't control yourself so well. Poor Lucian. I wonder what's going to happen to him. You know, I have a feeling Cousin Fred will be easier to be around now that Lucian's gone. I don't like to say this, but I think Lucian was playing jokes on him. Playing jokes on him? That diagram Cousin Fred made such a fuss about... I don't know whether I should tell anybody or not, but... Well, I saw Lucian throw it in the wastebasket. What? Oh, well, I'll be darned. You're sure, Carrie? Why, yes. We better tell him about it, then. Uh, no. No, I, I wouldn't want to do anything to cause anybody any trouble. Come back, please. Oh, for heaven's sakes, get some backbone, Carrie. Where is he? In his study with that detective... You know, I'm not sure I trust that man. You're afraid of your own shadow. Come on. But you, you mustn't go in without knocking. Cousin Fred won't permit that. You know he won't. But, but there's nobody... Hey! Look out! Oh! 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 You, you might have been killed. What is that? Oh, it's, a, it's an iron dumbbell from Lucian's gymnasium stuff. Well, you could see. It was held over the door by a piece of rope. When the door opened, the rope released it. Patty, Carrie, that noise, what was it? About 25 pounds of concentrated iron, Uncle Fred. Balanced right over your door. You see, Barton? Yeah. But this is the first time I've ever seen a murderer practice. Is somebody trying to scare Uncle Fred? Or does the would-be murderer really mean business? And why so cautious? Why not get it over in a hurry, hmm? Well, maybe that's what will happen in the second act of tonight's story. And now... Act two of Murder Takes Practice. It's 11 o'clock at night, and the Ellsworth family is getting ready to go to bed. I wonder where Lucian's staying tonight. I neither know nor care. Well, you're wrong there. Oh, no. If I have murder suspects, I want to keep them where I can watch them. But uh, you surely don't think Lucian... He could hardly have engineered that dumbbell business. After all, he wasn't even here. Well, he knows his way around the place, doesn't he? I'll bet you right now I could wander around this house for weeks without any of you knowing it. After all, this is a pretty good-sized hunk of a home. Nonsense. You don't like it because I did what was proper under the circumstances instead of following your advice. Oh, that noise. What was it? Oh, just a door slamming. No. There's somebody in this house. We'll all be killed. I'll go take a look, Miss Tenley, if it'll make you feel any easier. 
Halt! Wherever you are, halt, or I'll shoot. I mean it. <laughs> Carrie, I'm nervous enough without your screaming. All right, kid, come on. No funny stuff. You're lucky I didn't hit you. Lucian. Well, what of it? So you were skulking around here after you'd been told to leave. I walked out without any clothes or money or anything. I wasn't gone an hour before I realized I'd need some things for my room. I didn't want to talk to any of you, so I tried to get up to my room without your knowing about it. And got shot at for my pain. Do you happen to know anything about an iron dumbbell, Lucian? Huh? Oh, don't worry. I'm not taking it with me. Been checking to see if anything was missing, huh? Well, it's here. Carrie borrowed it to use as a doorstop for a bedroom door. Why? How about that, Carrie? Why, yes, I did, but... Oh, Cousin Fred, you don't think that means I put the thing up over your door. It's funny you hadn't mentioned it, Carrie. There's nothing funny about it. If something from your room were used in a murder attempt, I don't think you'd mention it either. You sound like a very philosophical person, Barton. But uh, I've got a hotel room to find tonight, so if you'll promise not to shoot at me again, I'll go on up and get my things together. No, you're not leaving here tonight, Lucian. You want to bet? I'd bet a good deal on it. You're a suspect. Oh, you flatter me. If you think I'm trying to murder Uncle, I should think you'd want me to clear out in a hurry. I'd like to keep murder suspects where I can watch them. Oh, uh, by the way, that brings up what we were coming to see you about, Uncle Fred. No, Patty, please. Coming to see me about? Yes, I wondered what you two were doing in the study. You've both been forbidden to enter the place without my being there. Uh, But we... That is, at least I thought you were there. And you know what I've always said about knocking before you come in, don't you? Well? Yes. Yes, I mentioned that to Patty when she started to open the door. Oh, let's not have another of those idiotic squabbles about the sacredness of your study. We came to tell you that Carrie has... No, Patty, you mustn't. It was different when I thought Lucian had left, but now you just can't. Can't what? What is this, anyway? Carrie says she saw you making that diagram of Uncle Fred's room. What? Of course I made a diagram of his room. Or rather, a floor plan. Yeah? Why? It was a classroom assignment. Floor plan of the largest bedroom in the house. I suppose it was part of your assignment to make those dotted lines from the window on the two doors to your uncle's bed. I didn't make any dotted lines. Somebody else did that. Somebody who saw me working and wanted to get me in bed. No, Lucian. I I wouldn't hurt you for anything. Who was it found the plan in the wastebasket? Patty. And of all the people in the place, who gains most by Unky's death? That's not so. But I'd get aside from what's rightfully mine already. I I don't know. But I rather imagine both you and Carrie get the bulk of Uncle Fred's own money, unless he's found time to change his will. Well, how about that, Mr. Ellsworth? Under the circumstances, Barton, I think it would be most uncircumspect for me to explain my will at the moment. Yeah, I see what you mean. Well, it's time to go to bed. I'm not staying here. Yes, again, lad. I'm going to escort each of you to your rooms. I'm going to watch you go in and close your doors. And my advice is to stay there. Who is it? Who is it, I said? And tell me... It's me, Carrie. Carrie, what in the world are you doing here? Didn't you hear what the detective said about staying in your own room? I'm afraid, Patty. I'm frightened half to death. Lucian's here, too, and after my telling what I saw, that plan, he may want to kill me, too. I'd rather you'd go back to your own room, Carrie. But together, a a murderer would be afraid. I've been doing some thinking, Carrie. You admit you saw Lucian make that diagram. You ordinarily empty the wastebaskets, but you had me do it the day I found that plan. And it was you who told me Uncle Fred was in the study this afternoon when I almost got my head bashed in. Patty, no, surely you don't think that I would commit murder. Whoever this murderer is, he or she is being awfully cautious. You're the most cautious person I've ever known. You have reason to hate Uncle Fred. At least as much reason as Lucian and I. But that's not true. Carrie, just what would you gain by Uncle Fred's death? What? You mustn't say such a thing, Patty. You mustn't. Help! What? Help! Somebody for the love of heaven! Fred, help! That's Uncle Fred. Come on. All right, stay in your rooms, all of you, till I tell you differently. Huh? Oh, hang it, all of you, out here. Okay, come on. Oh, 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 dear. Is, is he dead? Oh, it 
smells like chloroform in here. I, I can't stand. Oh, no, he's all right. We got to him in time. He can't be clear under. Hey, come on. Come on. Wake up. Huh? Wake up. Oh. Here's the cause. On his bed, right by the pillow. A rag soaked with chloroform. Well, toss it out the window before it makes the rest of us groggy. Okay. I, I woke up feeling sick. That sickly sweet smell. And I was dizzy. I tried to get up out of bed and I, I couldn't. I, I fell out, I guess, and started crawling to the door. I called. Thank goodness you heard me. But who would have chloroform? This stuff always makes me sick. But well, if you folks had followed my instructions, we'd know now who did this. Why? Because after you went to bed, I stuck a little piece of black thread on each door frame. I stuck it on with a dab of chewing gum and then draped the thread over the doorknob. Ah, that's very clever. Yeah, it would have been. They hadn't have all come rushing out when you called. Well, I don't suppose I can blame them. I'm glad somebody came. This time, Barton, I'd like to be with you when they go to their rooms. And I'm serving notice. I'm locking mine from the inside. All right, all of you. Those threads are in place across your doorknobs. Now, if anything else should happen, don't come out under any circumstances until I tell you to. Anybody who opens a door is open to suspicion as a would-be murderer. I hit that straight, all of you. Okay, Mr. Ellsworth. Come on. Yes. Do you suppose any of them could hear us now, Barton? Well, I don't see how. I have a plan to trap the murderer. A plan that will work. What kind of a plan? Here. You take my gun. You go to my room, I'll go to yours. Well, I don't think there'll be any more murder attempts tonight. A little thread should keep everybody at home now that they know about them. I'm not so sure. You get into my bed, keep the gun ready, and don't go to sleep. Okay. Might be worth a try at that. At least it'll keep you from being nervous. Thanks. And good night. What? What? Don't shoot, Barton. I've got another idea. Oh. What now? Wait. Wait till I close the door so nobody will hear. All right, just a second. I'll turn on the light. No. What? No, they might be watching. It would never do to let them know we're together. We can talk in the dark. Okay. Go ahead. What's on your mind? That day you came to my office soliciting business as a private detective. Yeah? What about it? I got to thinking about it afterwards. You asked a good many questions. Well, what of it? You weren't actually soliciting business. You were doing business right then, weren't you? Well, what makes you think that? Who'd hired you to spy on me, Barton? Harlow Morton. He wanted you to find out why I wouldn't let Patty marry him, didn't he? Sure. You can't blame him, can you? What did you tell him? Well, I told him I thought you'd stolen the girl's money and didn't dare let her get married. What made you think that? A little checking into your finances. And just what did you advise him to do about it? I told him there wasn't a thing in the world he could do about it, unless he wanted to lose his own shirt in a slander suit. But if I'd stolen money... And you could produce enough to cover, although it would strap you. And you're in charge of the trust. You'd be okay, and Harlow Morton would be at your mercy. You'd get enough damages to put you back on top again. You gave him very excellent advice. I hope he paid you well for it. Well enough. Why? Didn't you think it odd that I should hire you to handle these murder attempts for me? No, not at all. Most people don't know many private detectives. What a pity. What would you say if I were to tell you that everything that's happened has been leading up to this? It's all part of a plan. What are you talking about? Everything that's happened... I've done myself. Nobody ever suspect a man of trying to murder himself, would they? I put the dotted lines on the floor plan. The story about the dried beans was pure fabrication. I poisoned the dog. I never liked the animal anyway. I put that dumbbell over the door. I put the chloroform-soaked rag next to my pillow. You don't say why. To establish that somebody was trying to murder me. I knew what I was doing all the time. 
Okay, I'll bite. What were you doing? Building a plan to rid myself of Patty and you. Well, maybe I'm dense, Ellsworth, but I don't get it. And you were supposed to be a detective. <laughs> First, let me assure you that there's no use firing that revolver I gave you. You've instructed everybody to stay in their rooms till you call, and you'd never get a chance to call. That gun's loaded with blanks. <laughs> Pretty cute, Mr. Ellsworth. The gun I have in my hand is a little pearl-handled revolver that Patty kept hidden in her dresser. And is well covered with her fingerprints. I'm wearing gloves. And I've already removed the string from her door. My story will be that you asked me to change places with you. It'll sound perfectly logical. After all, you were a detective trying to catch a murderer. I'll have plenty of time to get back to your room again. Thanks to your instruction. I take it you're going to shoot me. Marvelous deduction. Oh. Okay. You're too smart for me. To make sure. No, no, you don't. What I said. Yeah. Yeah. You were firing at a bunch of bedding rolled up and put under the covers, Ellsworth. Maybe dumb, but one trick they teach you early in this game is you can't tell what direction a voice is coming from in the dark. Huh? You tricked me. You. But it's not too late yet. It's later than you think, Unky. Much later. Lucian, you... Barton came and got me right after you got into his bed, Unky. I've heard the whole works. And this gun I'm pointing at the back of your head isn't loaded with any blanks. That chloroform-soaked rag was the tip-off, Ellsworth. You had chloroform burns on your fingers, and none of the rest of them did. Ellsworth, I've seen some bunglers in my time, but you top them all. You took more practice than any murderer who'd ever lived and still muffed it. In the near future, virtual reality games are indistinguishable from the real world. Players can take on the role of a star quarterback or rule as the king of a virtual kingdom. 13-year-old Jake prefers to spend his free time building Zaloria, a virtual world he created from scratch, where he and his two best friends, Des and Carrie, spend their afternoons completing quests and collecting treasure. However, all in Zaloria is not what Jake expected. When Jake discovers that the world he built is growing and changing on its own, he and his friends uncover a secret that could change the world forever. Jake and his friends must fight for survival when his virtual world takes on a mind of its own. Game Alive, a science fiction adventure novel by Trip Ellington, narrated by Darren Marlar. Here a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Bobby, come to mommy. 
Tommy, it's time for lunch, honey. Bobby, come into the house. Bobby! Bobby! Oh, brother. This country bit isn't for me. I wish I were back on the jungle street. Bobby! I... Oh, Lord. The shed. Just like in my dream. Bobby! 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 Oh! Oh, no! Bobby, my baby. Oh, my darling, no. No. <laughs> Theater 5 presents Your Time Is Up. Pretty? Dover Ridge, pretty? Well, grass it's got, and trees, green stuff like that. Sure. So the cemetery. Moving out here was Paul's idea. I want Bobby brought up in the country, Rhoda, like I was, he told me. Not if his pop works in the city, I said. Honestly, I should have had my head examined. Me, Rhoda Powers, buried here in the sticks. Away from theaters and concerts and everything. Oh, not that I got to them very often. Pretty. On the first day I came to live here, Dover Ridge gave me the creeps. Lonely? Nuts. It was driving me psycho. Paul, I'd say, I, I got a feeling. It, this place is just no good for Bobby. Oh, Rhoda, that's ridiculous. You're, you're just projecting your own neurotic urban compulsions. Go fight City Hall. No, Paul, I'm talking about the baby. I told you about this horrible feeling these last couple of days. Feeling? Delusion? Delusion schmalusion. Paul, I can't get it out of my head. Like I see Bobby lying dead near that rickety old shed. And... Oh. Oh, Paul, please, take us back to the city anywhere. Brooklyn, even. We don't have to live in Greenwich Village again. Rhoda, but... stop the hysteria. Hysteria? Two days later, that was exactly where I found Bobby. Poor little doll. The, the rusty points of the big hay rake had driven through his body near the rickety old shed. Oh, that train whistle has been driving me bats all morning. I must be hearing things. There aren't that many trains a month through Dover Ridge. Paul. Paul, it seems to say Paul. Now I understand. It's that feeling like... Like just before Bobby died. The train. Paul, the 5.36 train tonight. An accident. Oh, of course. He's... Well, he's got it coming to him, Paul does. Even after Bobby left us, he wouldn't move back. Leaving me here all alone by myself all day. It's no wonder Arthur and I got together. Arthur at least listened to me. That is when he wasn't telling me about his painting. Arthur. Oh. If it happens, if Paul is... Like I had this feeling, we wouldn't have to sneak around like now. Oh, oh wouldn't that be something? Hey, girl. Let's tell him now, huh? You busy? Oh, hi, funny face. I thought you weren't going to call me today. Listen, Arthur, you I just... You know I have a deadline on this cover, baby. I was painting all last night It's and... about Paul. Well, what about Paul? Did he say anything about us? Hey, have you been blabbing? Oh, for heaven's sakes, no, nothing like that. I, I just had a feeling all morning that we won't have to worry about that kind of thing much longer. A feeling? Rhoda, do you know something that I don't? Well, something's going to happen to Paul. I know. You know what? He's going to be in a train accident today. What? Goodbye, Paul. Baby, if this is your idea of a joke... No, no joke, Arthur. 
It's just like before Bobby. I, I had the same feeling about Paul all this morning. Oh, good Lord, not Paul. But, look, Rhody, it's just a feeling. Well, with Bobby, it happened. And ever since, I'm like clairvoyant. Well, if you're that certain, Rhoda, you ought to take steps. You know, try to prevent it somehow. Why? Paul didn't lift a finger to save Bobby. And if it happens, well, you and I, we, we'd be free to do whatever we want. Oh, there. Hold your horses. Rhoda, don't count on me. You know I've never promised anything. Arthur. Arthur, you said you loved me. Oh, now, baby, you've been around. Just because we got kind of thrown together with Paul away all day, why, Paul's my friend. We should have broken off long ago. You know that. Rhoda, I can tell you lately I have felt like a louse. We ought to. Playing me for a chump. Look, I gotta get back to work. Goodbye, Arthur. Come on, no hard feelings. And, and Rhoda, do me a favor. Call Paul. Keep him away from that train today. Don't forget, Rhoda, you love Paul enough to marry him. Someday you'll thank me. For nothing. Just like I could bounce down the stairs. That's how I felt. Arthur's voice kept coming at me. Don't forget, Rhoda, you love Paul enough to marry him. I couldn't remember ever being that cockeyed about Paul. Mostly I remember... Hating to eat dinner all by myself in some joint. Someday you'll thank me. Oh, that'll be the day. It's not like I wanted Paul to die in a train accident. I just knew he would. Keep him away from that train today. No, why should I? Oh, maybe I ought to try. If anything happened to Paul and I hadn't tried, it would be like I did it myself. Now, that kind of a girl, I'm not. More advertising. Good morning. Paul Powers, please. Powers is in conference. Well, this is Mrs. Powers. Doris, it's urgent. Oh, sorry, Mr. Powers. He can't be disturbed. Would you please give me Mr. Powers? All right, Mrs. Powers, but I'm not responsible. One moment, please. Yes, Powers. What is it, please? Paul, it's me, Rhoda. Look, I, I told that girl... Not... Paul, listen, I am very upset. Rhoda, I can't have you interrupting my work all the time. Paul, you remember when Bobby was... Oh, Rhoda, don't start that again. Oh. I'm late for an appointment. I'll see you tonight. Paul, Paul, please. I called back. They said he'd be out all day. That, that just left one chance. Almost every day, Paul phoned me from the same booth a few minutes before he got on the train just so I could mix the martinis and toss the salad. Well, that's the kind of guy he is. He runs his life on a schedule like a train. So all I had to do was sit watching the clock all day, waiting for his call. Hello? Paul? Rhoda, it's me, Arthur. Arthur? I got nothing to say to you. Have you gotten hold of Paul? No, I couldn't reach him. And don't bother me and don't come around. Well, Paul would be suspicious if I suddenly disappeared. Look, if you don't get off the phone, Buster, he won't be alive to be suspicious. It's almost train time. Goodbye. Oh, come on. Ring. Ring. Oh, call you stupid idiot. Call. Paul. Paul, is it you? Are you expecting somebody else? No. No, of course not. Your phone was busy a minute ago. Who were you talking to? It was uh, uh, just a wrong number. Was it? Mm. Well, regular time. Have things ready? No. No, Paul, no. No? No, don't hang up. I... Well, if I don't get on now, somebody will take my seat. You know, I hate to sit anywhere else. Uh, remember when I called you this morning? Oh, we'll talk about it tonight at 8.45. No, listen to me, Paul. Don't get on the train. Huh? Stay in New York tonight. Rhoda, I don't want to be in your way or anything. I don't have to come home tonight. I don't have to come home again ever. Paul, it's nothing like that. Well, just why do you want to be alone? Alone? If there's anything I hate, it's, it's being alone. That's why you can't come home tonight. You're not talking sense, Rhoda. Oh, all right, I didn't want to, but I'll tell you. All day long, I've had the same feeling I had before Bobby was killed. Only, only this time, it was going to be you. And it was going to be the 536 train to Dover Ridge. Oh, now, really, Rhoda, how ridiculous can you get? Look, you took a course in psychology at the new school, didn't you? Can't you recognize a death wish when you see it? But, Paul, I don't want to see you die. If I did, I wouldn't have tried to call you up. 
Oh, Paul, please don't be so smug. Please, please let the train go without you. Absolutely not. I'm not running my life by your crazy whims. I'm getting my usual seat and my regular train at my regular time. Well, then go ahead. Just go ahead and do it. Do it. Get on your regular train and take your regular seat. I did everything I could. Now die, do you hear me? Die if you want to. Die. Die. <laughs> I told Paul to go ahead and die if he wanted to. I sizzled down. Nobody, but nobody has a temper like mine. I knew I had to make one more try to stop him from getting on that train. Like I say, Paul always called me from the same booth. And once I jotted down the number so I could call him back. Oh, busy. Oh, Someone took the booth. Yes? Hi, Rod. It's me again. Oh, Paul. I called the booth and the line was busy. I was dialing you. Look, uh, the train leaves in a minute. I, I called because you sounded so... so funny. I was disturbed. You weren't paying any attention to me. And I know I guess it sounds like a cockamamie story, but worst comes to worst. You stay in New York and, and there's no accident. Well, you say you hate to be alone at night in the country. Well, one night is better than, than forever, right? Well, what gave you the idea that I'd be in a train accident? I don't know, but didn't I tell you about Bobby before he was killed? Yes, Rhoda, you did, and I wish to God I'd listen to you. Well, Paul, will you listen to me now? But, honey, the whole thing is so irrational. Oh, for once in your life, admit. Admit that there are some things you can't figure out with reason and psychology. Brains I don't have, Paul. So maybe I got something else. Intuition, sixth sense, who knows? Just stay off the train, please. You really care? Oh, what do you think I am, Paul? Heartless or something? Look, I tried to call you at the office, and, and then you were out, and I couldn't do anything but wait. You really care that much, Rhoda? Well, what's so strange? Well, I just didn't know. You've been so remote from me recently. Well, maybe you've been Cary Grant to me. What? Oh, there's my train now. I've got to run. No, no. No, Rhoda. Oh, please, please. I can't figure you out, honey. But tonight I'm going to do what you ask. You'll stay? All aboard. The 536 is pulling out now. Oh, oh, Paul. Paul, I'm so happy I could scream. You know how I feel? I'm going to go down to the village and celebrate. Where? To Bonvini's. Where else? Isn't that where I met you? Oh, I wish I were with you. So do I. You know, I'll never forget that first time. <laughs> Remember what you said when Luigi asked if I could sit at your table? You said, I'll eat with anybody. Now, was that nice? <laughs> well, how about you? The way you looked at me, as if I were just a thing. No, Rhoda. I just didn't know any girls like you. The copper bracelet, uh, the dangling earrings, the thongs on your feet, that peasant blouse. So low cut. Mm, you sure noticed that. You almost got tangled up in your spaghetti. You know, Rhoda, I've never had so much fun before. You were so lively and so different from anyone I ever knew. Well, you look as if you could stand so far. You were so stiff and proper, like you were sitting, standing at attention. <laughs> I didn't even know your name. You know what I could never figure out, darling? Sure I know. Me. I never could figure out why you paid any attention to me. Now, what's so hard about that? You were a man. Only, <laughs> sometimes you look like a boy in his Sunday school suit. Besides, you treated me like a lady, and, and oh, you seem to have everything. I, I don't mean money, though. You had a lot more of that than the village characters I was going out with. But you seemed to know who you were, and where you were going, and why. And you had a haircut and a press suit, and <laughs> you didn't laugh a lot, but when you did, it was... It wasn't so that people would look at you. And all the things I sweated to have, like like education and poise and distinction, you know? Well, they seem born with you. I guess that's why I fell for you like a ton of bagels, Paul. And when you hinted we might get married, oh, I felt like I was Cinderella after the shoe fitting. Rhoda, you never told me that. I didn't think you'd like to hear it. Gee, I thought you liked me because I was kooky and cool. Your time is up. Goodbye.
deposit 45 cents, please. Oh, uh, one moment, operator. Oh. Thank you, sir. Oh. oh, you're sending a fortune. Worth every penny. You know, I've learned more over the phone here than in eight years of marriage. Well, you could also talk to me sometime when it doesn't cost. You could leave your attaché case in the office some evening. We could have fun like we used to. I'll bet we could. It's been a long time, Rhoda. Oh, tomorrow, Paul. You'll see. We'll start catching up, huh? Tomorrow? Why not tonight? Oh, but you're going to Bonavini's, and, and the next train is in an hour and a half. Oh, what's Luigi's without you, darling? And who says I have to wait for the next train? I'll take a cab. A cab? All the way to Dover Ridge? You're crazy. About you, Rhoda. Yes. Oh, darling, darling, tell the taxi to hurry. I'm on my way before that operator can say your time is up again. Your time is up. Deposit four. Never mind, operator. Bye, darling. In those few minutes, yakking with Paul on the phone, all the rust and cobwebs in our marriage were cleared away. I was looking forward to Paul's coming home. It was a long time since I felt that way about him. Still, that... That funny feeling I'd had all day it still hung around. And it had the same ingredients. Paul, the 536 train, an accident. Only now, in my mind, it got all mixed up with the operator saying, Your time is up. Your time is up. Your time is up. It made no sense now. Because Paul loved me and he trusted me. So he'd given up the train. He was coming by cab. No matter what happened to the train, nothing could harm Paul. Oh, it was six o'clock. I had a lot to do before Paul arrived. As I started to prepare dinner, I had a funny thought. Arthur had said that someday I'd thank him. I thought he was crazy. Well, it was Arthur who told me to get a hold of Paul and tell him to stay off the 536. So when I was about ready... Arthur, Rhoda. Yes? I wanted to talk to you. Look, kiddo, I told you this morning that I didn't want to play games anymore. Oh, me neither, Arthur. That's over. But I just have a couple of minutes before Paul will be in. Well, the train hasn't passed here. He's not coming by train, Arthur. I got a hold of him and I talked him out of it and... You know what? Paul wanted to get home to me so badly. He took a cab all the way from New York. Paul spent money on a cab? Oh, no. Anyway... Arthur, you know what you said this morning? That someday I'd thank you? I think you will. Well, this is the day. Rhoda, you're a good kid. Hey, Rhoda, guess what? what? I see Paul's cab. You do? Yeah, on the road. <laughs> it sure looks funny. A New York City cab way out here. Boy, it's gone about 80. What's that? Is that the train? Yeah, it's just at the crossing. Oh. Oh, no. Rhoda. The cab. Paul's cab is racing the train to the crossing. Arthur? No! Arthur! Arthur, what was that? What's happening? Oh, never mind, Arthur. I know. I know. I, I guess I knew all along. <laughs> Paul wanted to be buried in Dover Ridge. He liked it here. And so I stayed. I hate the country and I'm alone. But I guess I'd hate it and be alone anywhere. We came here because Paul wanted Bobby brought up in the country. Well, now they're both gone. But I might as well stay. I know that no matter what I do, even if I live in a crowded city... I'll never escape my loneliness. Theater 5 has presented Your Time Is Up. Written by Raphael David Blau and directed by Warren Somerville. In the cast... Natalie Priest, Betty Walker, Paul McGrath, and Norman Rose. Audio engineer, Neil Pulse. Sound technician, Ed Blaney. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. 
Original music by Alexander Vlastatsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Edward A. Byron. We invite and would appreciate your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry, too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla, the only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Very Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Presenting The Whisperer, starring Carlton Young. The Whisperer, a brilliant man who, losing his voice in an accident which crushed his vocal cords, worked his way deep within the crime syndicate to help destroy it from within. To the underworld, his familiar rattling hiss is the voice of authority to be obeyed without question. Then a miracle of surgery performed by Dr. Benjamin Lee restored his natural voice enabling him to resume his real identity. Now, as Philip Galt's brilliant young attorney, he skirts the thin edges of death living his dual role. For as the whisperer, he sets in motion the forces of the syndicate in Central City. Then, as Philip Galt uses his knowledge to fight the organized network of crime which seeks to control the fate of millions in cities and towns across the nation. The only person besides Dr. Lee who knows the Whisperer's real identity is Dr. Lee's nurse, Ellen Norris. Now, on her day off, she listens as Philip Galt uses his Whisperer's voice to report back to the syndicate. Instructions given to Porter will report back when he completes his mission. Bill! Not George Zimmerman, the furniture dealer. That's only a blind, Ellen. Zimmerman is the syndicate's top man in the bookie division. Every dollar wagered finds its way to him. He keeps the local share and sends the rest to New York. But I know him. He comes in for calcium shots. Well, the syndicate is substituting lead for calcium. Why is he in trouble? Well, the Treasury Department has established that his income was $200,000, and he only declared 50000 But if he sent the rest to New York, it really isn't his. That's true. But if he tells who he sent it to... It uncovers someone higher up in the syndicate. Right. He's a weak man who will probably turn state's evidence. That's why they've ordered his death. But who's Bradbury? A silent partner of Zimmerman's who deserves anything that happens to him. Well, they'll never be able to kill him while they're in jail. No place is safe when the syndicate decides a man is to die. That's why, as the whisperer, I'm going to warn Lieutenant Denvers. Lieutenant Denvers? Double your guard on Bradbury and Zimmerman. Hey, who is it? Otherwise, they'll be killed. Oh, what kind of a 
trick is... Will he take your warning? Can't afford to take chances, but just to be sure, how would you like to run down to police headquarters in about an hour? I'll be ready. And I shall wall my trusty seat outside, and the fellow in the wrinkled suit and beneath the wilted chrysanthemum will be I. One hour later in the jail, John Bradbury and George Zimmerman, the men marked for death, sit silently. Then as Lieutenant Denvers comes down between the cell tiers, Zimmerman crosses to the cell bars and calls softly. Lieutenant Denvers. Huh? Yes, Zimmerman. Uh, look, I've been thinking this thing over. I'm not admitting anything, but suppose I had information of value to the government. I'm a police lieutenant. I don't make any deal. Well, frankly, I'm afraid. If I take the rap, it means the loss of my reputation and the resulting shame to my family. Well, you should have thought of that sooner. If I turn state's evidence... You may wind up standing on the river bottom with your feet in a barrel of cement and the paddle wheels of a river steamer knocking your hat off. Who said next time try the train? Yeah. Just stretch out on that bus. Well, nighty night. Remember, if you hear any strange noises, it'll be Gabriel calling his horn. He's really got a snoop full. I wish I were that happy. Zimmerman, you're in a spot. No matter what you decide to do, I doubt if you'll ever be happy again. Lieutenant? Huh? Oh, hello, Galt, Miss Norris. Hello, Lieutenant. Well, what do you want? Oh, you don't seem to be your own chipper self. Uh, there's always some screwball making with the foolishness. Some bird calls me up, whispers to me there's going to be an attempt made on two of my prisoners. Did you double your guard? How'd you know that's what he wanted? Well, that would seem the natural precaution. Oh, yes. Lieutenant? Yeah? Those kids are here with Mrs. Barwise to tour the jail. What kids? 8th Street Elementary. Is that Barwise woman there? Put her on. Talk right into this, Miss Barwise. Hello! Move back, lady. You're blasted. So are you. That'll hold you, Lieutenant. Uh, what's this all about? Last night over the radio, the mayor invited everyone to tour the municipal offices. My students have wanted to see a jail, so I'm going All right. Around. All right, lady. All right. Sergeant? Yes, Lieutenant? Show them around. The works? The works. Wish that two-headed mayor had to... Oh, what's the use? Lieutenant, I'd like to talk with George Zimmerman. Huh? What for? Well, after all, I'm a lawyer. All right, you can go, but she stays here. Oh, please let me go, too, Lieutenant. I'll remove the submachine gun from my right stocking, the stiletto from my left, and the hand grenade. All right, all right, all right. Stop pulling my leg. <laughs> You're up on the fifth floor. Wait five minutes, I'll take you up. I didn't take the warning seriously, but I doubled the guards just to be safe. Sounds like a tie tie for a policeman is touring the fifth floor. He had no business bringing those kids up here. You said the works was Sergeant! Sergeant, Sergeant, make those kids pipe down. You try it, Lieutenant. All right. I've always wondered where Banshee's come from. Now I know. Who's in charge of these hoodlums? Here I am, down at the end of the room. Lady, please, tell him to shut up or get out. But the mayor... Hang the mayor! You do! Now get these cowboys quiet or I'll, I'll, I'll take their toy guns away and make them eat them. Yes, sir. Get that kid away from that window. Yes, of course. Johnny, be careful. Oh, Looks like I broke it myself. That does it. Sergeant, get him out. Out, out, out. All right, kid, move along. Come on, now into the elevator. You have it. The out. mayor is certainly going to hear about this. The ma- out. <laughs> oh, Lieutenant, I suggest you get a book on child psychology. Uh, I suggest you get a shillelagh. Shillelagh? I like Miss Norris's suggestion best. <laughs> All right, this way. Help! Help! What's that? Coming from down the corridor. Lieutenant Zimmerman, you've got to get me out of here. All right, pipe down now, Zimmerman. No one can hurt you here. Oh, no? Look. Huh? <laughs> Bradbury. <laughs> Shot right between the eyes. Well, that tears it. Let me stop right in my own jail. Well, Lieutenant, you can't lock us in here. I'm afraid he's already done it, Ellen. But why? Because whoever murdered Bradbury is still on this floor. Still, did Porter kill Bradbury? I'm sure of it. 
He used a gun with a silencer, which was covered by the noise made by the kids and the breaking window. But which one is Porter? I've never seen him. But when the lieutenant finds the gun, the man in the cell will be Porter. Oh, Zimmerman. Tell me just what happened. Well, we were standing at the bars watching the kids. After they were gone, I turned around and he was dead. From this position, I'd say whoever shot him was across from this tier of cells. No, it couldn't be. There were just two burglar suspects and a drunk over there. Well, he can't get rid of the gun. Oh, he can, huh? Well, he did. You didn't find it? We went over every cell, convict and cranny with a fine-tooth comb and a mind detector. There are just two guns on this floor, mine and yours. All right, hand it over, Gorf. Just a minute, Lieutenant. Hand it over, I said. Always happy to cooperate. Here. Now that you see it hasn't been fired, I'll just look at yours. Well, I mean it. Denver's wouldn't be the first police officer with a blot on his conscience. Hold, I ought to bash your face. Stop Make a pass and I'll flatten you, Denver's. All right, here. Check my gun, then get out. If you ever make another crack like that, Galt, only one of us will walk away. Wise to antagonize Lieutenant Denver? He's always suspicious of a possible connection with the syndicate. By making him mad, I took his mind off the syndicate angle. Now he just hates you for yourself. Well, apparently nobody there killed Bradbury. So I guess one of the six-year-olds did it. Uh, Ellen, that's it. Oh, now, Phil. They may go with their toy gun. No, 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 no. no. I I mean, uh, Mrs. What's-her-name. She was the only adult there when Bradbury was killed who wasn't searched. Denver sent her and the kids away before the body was discovered. A woman murderer? If all the men killed by women were alive today, Ellen, there'd be a big increase in the male population. Yeah? I'm trying to locate a woman in the school district who has shown great interest in the children. Yeah, Mrs. Barvash is... That's the name. Yeah, two houses down she lives. Splendid. No, here she is. But so fine she is. Sure she is. Yeah, that too. Uh, may I use your phone? Yeah, right here on the wall. It is? Lieutenant Andrews. I found the Barwise woman. Oh, uh, where? 900 block in Cohasset. I'll uh, be right out. Don't do a thing till I get there. You are listening to The Whisperer, the story of Philip Galt, who skirts the thin edges of danger living his dual role. Philip Galt, as The Whisperer, has passed on the orders of his superiors in the syndicate to a man named Porter to kill John Bradbury and George Zimmerman. Somehow, Porter managed to get into the jail, kill Bradbury, and conceal both his identity and the murder weapon. Now, Phil works to save Zimmerman, the man whose testimony the government needs to uncover higher-ups in the syndicate. Phil and Ellen approach the home of Mrs. Barwise. Are you sure Lieutenant Denver said to go ahead with your questioning? Ellen, how can you doubt me? It's no effort at all. Hello? Uh, uh, yes, (laughs) Uh, I'm Philip Gold, and I, I saw you... At the police station. I'm poor at remembering names, but I never forget a figure. Come in, Mr. Gold. <clears throat> and bring your mother with you. Oh, excuse me. This is Miss Morris. Uh, Norris. I came with you, remember? Won't you come in? No, thank you. Mr. Gold, would you like an oatmeal cookie? Oh. Uh, I'd love one. And you, Mrs. Morris? Miss Norris. Oh, I'm so sorry. Did you bake them? Of course. When? Why, this morning. Why, you were in jail? I was not in jail, Miss Morris. Oh, dear, would you excuse me? That dame and oatmeal cookies go together like a minnow and a hungry shark. Ellen. Well, she's guilty. I can tell by her perfume. Miss Barwise, I'm Lieutenant Denver. Man was killed this morning while you were at the jail. And, oh, and you wonder if I killed him. Is that why you came, Mr. Gall? Well, you see, I... Uh, would you mind coming down to headquarters? No, not at all. Mrs. Morris can ride back with you, Lieutenant, and I'll ride with Mr. Gall. Now, just a minute, I... And when they find me not guilty, you, Mr. Gall, may bring me back home and tell me how sorry you are. <laughs> Mr. Gall may 
bring me back home and tell me how sorry you are. I got news for her. I already know how sorry you are. You know, green becomes you, my dear. How long does it take to test for gunpowder stains on her claws? Oh, I apologize for this inconvenience. Oh, please, Lieutenant, you were only doing your duty. Ready, Mr. Gore? You mean she didn't do it? No, Miss Norris. No stains on her hands? None. Maybe she wore gloves. No, I distinctly remember she didn't wear gloves. You would. Well, there's nothing more I can do. Ready, Mr. Gore? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, Ellen, I, I, I'll see you at your place later. That was the understatement of the year. <laughs> Half an hour later, Philip Galt lets Mrs. Barwise out in front of her home, drives to a variety store, makes a purchase, and tucking it in his belt, stops in front of Ellen's apartment, then goes in. Ellen! Well, it certainly took you long enough to deliver that man-eating blonde. Well, I hurried as fast as she'd let me. Well, wipe the oatmeal cookie crumbs off your chin and tell me what she said. Ellen, I won't stand for that kind of talk. Huh? The syndicate has found out about you. Oh, well, you're joking. They've ordered me to kill you. Hell. Get ready to die. I've done, I've done. Goodbye, Ellen. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what cat pistol. Phil got out to throw something at you. I will throw something no, at hey. you. No, oh, oh, hey. No. My best laugh, but it was worth it. Oh. Now, what's this all about? Holy smoke. If you, if you can calm down for just a minute. I, well, at first, the idea was too fantastic, but now I don't know. You thought this gun was real. Well, it looks exactly like a real one. Well, if that's true, then a real one would look like a cat pistol. Especially if a six-year-old child was wearing it in this holster. That's fantastic. Not if what I think is true is true. Operator, give me New York, circle 1798. Have you completely lost your mind? I'll know in a minute. A midget? It's a bum guess. They never heard of such a killer. That means they didn't send one here to dress like a six-year-old and kill Bradbury and Zimmerman. Phil, how in the world could Porter or anyone for that matter get into that jail, shoot Bradbury, and then get rid of the gun without a clue? Ellen, unless we find the answer to that before tomorrow, the same thing will happen to Zimmerman. But who's Porter? Well, he can't be you, myself. Lieutenant Denvers, Mrs. Barwise, or Zimmerman. But he could be one of those three men in the cells across from Zimmerman. Even that seems impossible. They've probably been in jail several days, and Porter was free this morning because I talked to him. Phil, there's one man we overlooked. Overlooked? Yes. Sergeant Oakes. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Denvers sent him out at the same time he sent Mrs. Barwise and those kids. Lieutenant Denvers. Lieutenant, did you check Sergeant Oakes' gun? Sergeant Oakes? Well, I've known him for 15 I know, years. but why not make the tests and be sure? Gold, you're as crazy as a march hare. All right, I'll do it. Thank you. I'm coming down to headquarters, Lieutenant. I want to be there when the report comes in. But still, how could a police officer be Porter? Remember, Ellen, I've never seen Porter. If Sergeant Oakes is in the employ of the syndicate, he could have taken the message, and then during the excitement of those kids breaking the window, could have killed Bradbury. And no one would ever suspect a police officer of such a thing. Well, we'll soon know. To you. Oh, you. Now, oh, what's wrong, Lieutenant? Here, read this. Well, results of paraffin test for polish stains, Sergeant J.P. Oaks. Definite traces on right thumb and four. Oh, damn. Both, I've never been hit this hard. I would have staked my life on that man. What was his explanation? That he got him on the pistol range. Isn't that possible? No, uh, I couldn't take a chance, so I suspended him, put him under temporary detention, and... Send his gun to ballistics for a check against the murder slug we recovered from Bradbury's cell. Well, how soon will the report... Yeah? You did? Proves it, huh? All right, thanks. Tests prove he did it? No. Happy to say they prove he did not. Well, then who could have done it? Until now, I've never believed in Gremlin. But now? No, I'm not so sure. <laughs> Faced with a murder in which apparently none of those present could possibly have been guilty, Philip Galt decides to make further inquiries about the only logical outside suspect, Mrs. Barwise. Back in the 8th Elementary School District, he knocks on a familiar door. Yeah? I'm back with more questions about the Barwise family. 
Uh, there is a Mr. Barweiss, isn't there? Yeah. Such a happy man he is. Singing always he is. Have you seen him today? Yeah, only this morning I see him. About what time? The 915 Bossy Court. Why you not ask Mrs. Barweiss? Well, I tried to, but no one answered my knock. Oh, yeah. Of course, now I remember. Another bunch of kids she takes to visit the chair. When? When did she leave? It makes almost an hour now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, what happened to you? Go in stalling and come out in the merry mood. I've been working on the rain. I prefer Gordon McRae. Oh, Ellen, my dear, it all just fell into place. Now, if we hurry, I think we can deliver to Lieutenant Denver's one murderer. Caught, as I believe the expression is, red-handed. While Phil and Ellen speed toward the jail, hoping to prevent the murder of George Zimmerman, Mrs. Barwise and Lieutenant Denvers are engaged in heated conversation. For the last time, no, you cannot make another tour. Last time you went up there, a man was killed. But you proved that I didn't do it, Lieutenant. Well, I'm taking no chances. Now, you just stay here. Oh. Hello, Lieutenant. Mrs. Barwise. Now what? Are we having another tour? Mrs. Barwise isn't. What do you mean by that? I'm holding her here. What about the children? I sent them on the tour with Sergeant Oates. How long ago? Oh, five, ten minutes. Mrs. Barwise, do you mind if I look in your purse? Oh, I certainly do. Why bother, Galt? As long as she and the purse are here, they can't do any harm. I'm sorry, Mrs. Barwise, but Give I... Give me back that purse. It's none of your business. Look. A gun. A gun? <laughs> it's nothing but a cap pistol. Were any of those prisoners across the corridor from Zimmerman admitted today? Yeah, that happy drunk. We picked him up about ten this morning. Oh, relax, Galt. There's nothing to worry about. There's just one thing, Lieutenant. Unless we reach the fifth floor before those kids do, that happy drunk is going to kill George Zimmerman. What? Come on. But where would he get a gun? From his wife. But no one's visited him. His name is Barwise. That's his wife in your office. Well, he said his name was Porter when we booked him. But she still hasn't been up there. There's no gun in his cell. That I know. One will get you 20. He has one by the time we got there. You mean he shot bribery? Yes, and Zimmerman's next. Hey... There's Porter at the cell door. He has a gun. Porter! Porter dropped that gun. Hello? Please! I let him have it! Good shooting, Gaul. Dr. Noakes, get those kids out of here. Wait. Line them up against the wall while we check on Zimmerman. Come on, lads. Sal Barr got the way of his first shot. Why keep the kids? I'll show you. They're all lined up, Lieutenant. More or less. Good. Now, six cowboys in the group wearing their toy guns. Oh, no. Oh, yes. This fellow here has an empty holster. Look, Gold, give it to me easy. I still don't believe it. It's diabolically simple, Lieutenant. Barwise, or Porter, as he called himself, got picked up on a drunk charge. So he'd be put across from Bradbury and Zimmerman. His wife brought the kids, and during the tour, removed a toy gun from this little fellow's holster and substituted a real one. It was so obvious, no one would think of checking each kid's holsters. And that's why we found a cap pistol in her handbag? Yes. Remember, Barwise, or Porter, knows all these kids. He called the youngster over to his cell. Then Mrs. Barwise broke the window, centering everyone's attention on that. Like the rest of us, the youngster turned to look. Barwise killed Bradbury, slipped the gun back into the holster, and when you drove the kids out of the tier, there went your murder gun. But, Galt, wouldn't the kid notice something? Not necessarily, Lieutenant. The gun has a silencer. And remember... To a six-year-old, all real guns are toys, and all toy guns are real. And that's how they did it, Ellen. It took clever people to think up such a plot. Now, the syndicate pays well for brains. But now Zimmerman will testify, and one more link of the syndicate will be exposed. And that's good, too. Or if you break enough small links, someday the entire chain becomes useless. All of which leaves me consumed with hunger. You owe me food. Well, as soon as I report to the syndicate, you shall have it. Uh, oatmeal cookies. But not baked by Mrs. Barwise. Where she's going, they'd scorch. Central City reporting. Porter bungle job. And was killed. Impossible to prevent Zimmerman's... Testimony. For new instructions, I will call Chicago at midnight. The Whisperer. The Whisperer is based upon stories and characters created by Stetson Humphrey. 
Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Carlton Young is starred as The Whisperer. Betty Moran is Ellen. Others in the cast were Betty Lou Gerson, Paul Fries, Julius Kralbein, Dan Riss, and Bob Anderson. The Whisperer was written, produced, and directed by Bill Karn. Original music by Johnny Duffy. Your announcer has been Don Rickles. Next week, listen to another exciting adventure with... The Whisperer! Are you a member of the Darkness Syndicate? The Darkness Syndicate is a private membership where you receive commercial-free episodes of the Weird Darkness podcast and radio show, behind-the-scenes video updates about future projects and events I'm working on. You can share your own opinions on ideas to help me decide upon Weird Darkness contests and events. You can hear audiobooks I'm narrating before even the publishers or authors get to hear them. You also receive bonus audio of other projects I'm working on outside of Weird Darkness. You get all of these benefits and more starting at only $5 per month. Join the Weird Darkness Syndicate at WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash syndicate. Darling, that's not it. It isn't, Nora? No, it goes like this. Thirty-three fine brews blended into one great beer. Taft's Blue Ribbon Beer presents The New Adventures of the Tin Man with Nick and Nora Charles, the happiest, merriest married couple in radio. Tonight and every Tuesday night at this same time, that international favorite, Pabst Blue Ribbon Beer, proudly presents the finest in summertime entertainment. So sit back, relax, and pour yourself a tall, foaming glass full of blended Blended Pat Blue Ribbon. While you listen to the stars of our show, Claudia Morgan as Nora and Les Fermaine as Nick, in tonight's Adventure of the Thin Man, entitled The Adventure of the Passionate Palooka. <laughs> It's one o'clock in the morning of one of those sizzling July nights that make the average New Yorker feel like a hot dog on a griddle with mustard. We find our hero, Nick Charles, tossing restlessly in his bed and mumbling to himself. Uh, I wonder if I ought to get in order. They hit me on my head with one of my old black jacks. Oh, no, she'd enjoy that too much. Oh, you know, I be... Oh, nuts. Of course, Nora is twitching away in her bed, too. And when she notices that Nick's managed to close his eyes and doze off, she mumbles sweetly to herself. He can't do that to me, the big goon. What right has he got to sleep in a night like this and leave me alone in my misery? And so, with genuine wifely devotion, she gently wakes Nick up. Nick! The hmm? floor, what'd you say? Fire? Yes, the fire. How? When? Where? On my sheets, it's... and I'm cooking. Were you asleep? Yes. I thought so. Is that why you woke me? Well, you had no right to do it without telling me how. Do what? Fall asleep. Well, dear, I, I thought of hundreds of people diving into swimming pools. Female people. <laughs> why, yes, but they were all beautiful. They all look like you. Oh, nice. Maybe I'll think of hundreds of you jumping into a pool. Well, that's a great idea. Makes me feel cooler already. You're making your first leap. You're diving. I look like a swan, huh? You land flat on your tummy. Hey, 
must be thinking of someone else, Nora. I never dive like that. Now you're under the water. Uh, what stroke am I doing? You've disappeared. Yeah, hey, wait a minute. Uh, don't I come up? No, I can't see you. Well, Nora, get me out of here. I'm drowning. <laughs> I'm diving in after you. The crowds are applauding. Uh, hurry, will you? I'm fishing around for you. I'm over here. I've got you. Yeah. Hey, let go. You're pulling my hair. Keep quiet. I'm rescuing you. Nora, baby, you're being carried away. You're uh, pulling me out of bed by the hair. That's the way you rescue people, you go. But I haven't got that much hair left. Cut it out. Let me drag you to the shore first. Oh, I'm on the floor, Nora, dear. Or is it the shore? It's the shore. Everyone is pinning medals on me and saying, what did she ever want to rescue him for? Oh, nuts. Now you've just about ruined all my chances of ever falling asleep. That's a fine thing to say to a wife who just saved your life. Who wants to speak tonight, anyway? What do you think we should do? Let's go out. Go out? Mm -hmm. At this hour? Nora, do you want me to become the kind of a bum I used to be? Mm hmm. Just for tonight. <laughs> okay, baby. Nick the Dick prowls again. <laughs> Glad we came out. Look, the whole town's up. Yeah. And look what we're walking into a band of serenaders. <laughs> hey, Bud, would you and your girl like to find a way to forget the heat? We certainly would, Mr. Uh, Bud. Then join the Gutter Glee Club for unmusical verses. Oh, I'd like to, but won't you get into trouble singing in front of that apartment house? For the astronomical rent they pay in that joint, they deserve a little music. Come on, Nicky, you know plenty of wrong notes. Let's sing. it up, Nora. The man on the spear sucker who just ran out of the building. Go on, go on, go on. Oh, oh I'm really? call a cop. The trouble with you, buddies, you ain't got no joy in your heart. But I got two musical ears on my head. Go on, skedaddle. Oh, go yeah. on. Oh. Nick, there's a man who would put the harps in heaven out of tune. I think I know that guy. Well, if you do, you shouldn't. He looks so grouchy. I bet he bites himself for breakfast every morning just to make sure he feels sore. Well, well, what are you waiting for? A contribution? Aren't you Scoot Skillet, the fight manager? Yeah, well, what if I get... Nick! Nick Charles! <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> uh, where'd she get her? Oh, I, I figured I needed a manager, so I let her sign me up for life. Glad to know you, Mrs. Charles. <laughs> hey, say, Nick, uh... You want to get a piece of something good? I'll sell you half of Adam Baum Brickenhead for only two grand. Well, who's Adam Baum Brickenhead? My sensational new fighter who's meeting the champ tomorrow night. Oh. Well, which half of this prize fight are you selling? <laughs> She's the educated type who don't know nothing about nothing, huh, Nick? <laughs> I mean a half interest. Why should you want to sell before the big fight, Scoots? I need money fast. What do you say, Nick? No dice. What's wrong with Brickenhead? Get this. How'd you get? Because you wouldn't sell a half interest in the right time if you could make a buck at it. Well, then maybe you can help me. Listen, the atom bomber just ain't himself. Nobody can find out what's eating him. Being as you're a detective, maybe you can find out, Nick. Where is Mr. Adam Baum? Upstairs. I know it. Chased away them fingers. Well, just what's wrong with him? Even the doctors can't find out. They says it's all in his mind. So I calls him a mind specialist. A head doctor. And you know what he tells me? What? That the Adam Bomber ain't got no mind. And this information cost me 25 bucks an hour. Well, of course we'll help you, Mr. Scoot. Come, Nicky, let's meet this mindless wonder. Hello, Scoot. Hello, sunshine. Bomber, I want you to meet Nick and Nora Charles. Oh. Cheers. Hello, Mr. Adam Bomber. What's this cheers business? I heard it in the movie. It seems so debonair. Oh, I'm so unhappy. Bomber, uh, suppose you tell us what's bothering you. Nothing. Except I'm miserable. Why are you miserable? Because I'm unhappy. But why are you unhappy? Because I'm miserable. See, it's, it's a vicious cycle. 
Oh, me. But, Farmer, there must be some reason why you're groaning like a sick cow. I wish I was a cow. Well, you got the voice for it, but your figure's wrong. Yeah, yeah, there's a catch to everything, ain't there? Oh, uh, just a second. Why do you wish you were a cow? Why not? I wish I was anything as long as I ain't me. But what's wrong with you? Nothing hurts me nowhere, Doc. Listen, no mind. These ain't doctors. They're detectives. They thought they might help you. Well, nobody can help me. Not even Betty Gray. Detectives? Did you say detectives? Why, yes. Detectives. Look, Nick. He's coming to life. He don't look dead no more. He looks dumb like he used to be. Uh, leave me alone with these two people. I, I got to talk to him alone. What's the matter? You don't trust me no more? No, but I, I, I'm, I'm temperamental. I'm trained to a fine part, nervous and, and high strung, like an underbred thoroughbred. You are? I know I am because I read about me in tonight's sports page. Now, now, uh, leave me alone with him. Okay, Barmo. Nick, Nora, you're the only two people in the world who can help me. Can we? I didn't want to tell no one before because no one thinks I've got any brains, which is true. You see, Nick, it's JoJo. I love JoJo. Well, what happened to JoJo? She's gone. She left me. Why? I don't know. I always treated her good. I, I never even kicked her. Not even once. How sweet of you. I never even kept her chained up. Hey, maybe I should have chained her up, huh, Nick? Well, there are two schools of thought about that, but it's good for some females. Yeah. Whenever she got hungry, I always threw her a bone. Well, how generous of you. What's that? What kind of a dame are you in love with? A high class kind, of course. Who eats bones? Lulu, don't eat bones. She eats caviar. Lulu? But we were talking about Jojo. How many people do you love, Mr. Atombomber? Just three. Me, Jojo, and Lulu. Uh, now, let's take them one at a time. Who's Jojo? Just the most beautiful mongrel dog I ever found in an alley, that's all. And I love her. When did the dog disappear? On the night I fought with Lulu. Oh, Lulu's a prize fighter. No, but she should be with the right she's got. Lulu is a girl. Jojo is a dog and me. Me, I'm a rare phenomenon. You are? That's what the doctor said I was. Nick, Nora, promise me you won't tell nobody what's wrong with me. Not even Scoot. Why? Well, if everybody knew how I felt about JoJo, they'd think I was dumber than I really am. Can I help it if I love dogs? We'll keep your secret. And now, will, will you find JoJo for me? How can I win the world's championship tomorrow night? Knowing JoJo is walking the street with no one to scratch a flea. Look at me. Take pity on me. I'm, I'm wallowing in woe. I'm crying. We'll find your doggy, Mr. Adam Bomber, before tomorrow night. Mrs. Charles. You're a dear, sweet poison. Almost as sweet as... as Jojo. Mickey, darling, what makes you think we can find a dog in a nightclub like this? I mean, a dog who not only bites, but barks. You mm hope. -hmm. Have you ever heard of Banana Nose Norbert? Is it an ice cream sundae or a relation of Jimmy Durante? He's the guy who owns this dive, and he practically runs the underworld of this town. We became friends when I sent him up the river years ago. Nick, you promised me that we were going to live in the upper world from now on. Well, I was afraid you'd object. That's why I brought you here before I told you the reason. Nora, baby, it isn't as if this was a detective case or something, but... Do you think that dog disappeared by accident? You mean the poor pooch is the victim of dog snatchers? Well, do you think smart gamblers would stop at stealing a dog if they knew the effect it would have on the atom bomber? Hell no, Nick. Wait a second, you wanted to see me. Oh, banana no. Uh, this is my wife, Nora. Well, well, well. Well, one that never sees but the first guy who ever came into this joint with a beautiful tomato that he was actually married to. Why, thank you, Mr. Banana Nose. <laughs> you don't mind that I called you tomato, Mrs. Charles? No, if you don't mind my calling you Banana Nose. Nah. Banana Nose and tomato. We ought to get together and open a vegetable store. <laughs> That's pretty funny. Uh, listen, Banana Nose, 
I'm looking for the pup that was stolen from Adam Bomb Brickenhead. Oh, yeah? Why? We promised to return him. Without that dog, Mr. Adam Bomb is so depressed he'll hardly be able to fight tomorrow night. Oh, oh. So that's why the odds went down against him. You know, Nick, a few weeks ago, the experts figured him to beat the champ. He will beat the champ if he has his doggy. Ah. If he does, someone named me can clean up a load of loot. Nick, your worries are over. They are? Just tell me what the pooch looks like, and by tomorrow morning, you will have that dog in your apartment for breakfast. You are listening to the new adventures of the Thin Man, presented for your summertime entertainment by the makers of that international favorite, Pat Blue Ribbon Beer. Just before our program started tonight, you heard on your radio those NBC chimes. You know, that bing, bong, bell. Now, you've probably heard that NBC musical signal 150 times or more. And every time you've heard it, bing, bong, bell, it made exactly the same sound. Well, I can't think of a better way to illustrate the uniformity of Pabst Blue Ribbon. If you enjoy a good glass of beer, you've probably ordered Pabst Blue Ribbon 150 times or more. And I'm sure you noticed every glassful was exactly alike. Not too heavy, not too light, but fresh, clean, sparkling. With the real beer flavor coming through just the way you like it. Now, how does Pat keep it that way year after year? <laughs> well, I can sing the answer to that one, too. Thirty-three fine brews blended into one great beer. Yes, that Pabst blending process is costly, and it takes infinite patience, but the result? Well, I'll leave it to your sense of taste. Why not order a few cans or bottles and learn why millions the world over have settled down to blended, blended Pabst Blue Ribbon? Catch Act Two of tonight's Thin Man Adventure. Nick and Nora Charles have promised to find Jojo, the mongrel pooch whose mysterious disappearance has broken the heart of Adam Bomber Brickenhead, the heavyweight challenger who lacks a mind. It's now eleven thirty in the morning, and we find our hero and heroine at breakfast. Nicky, do you know what I dreamed about last night? Huh. Don? Yes. How'd you find out? I dreamed about him, too. Well, darling, tonight Mr. Adambaum goes into the ring to battle for the championship. And he's still dogless. Well, don't worry, dear. Banana Nose Norbert won't fail us. He said he'd have the dog here for breakfast. We're having breakfast. And no dog. Oh, now, Nora, you mustn't take it so hard. Oh, why not? Poor Mr. Adambaum. Without a mind, without a dog, and with a broken heart. What's he got? Cauliflower ears, 200 pounds of solid muscle, and uh, an appealing personality. I think Lulu's behind the whole thing. The Adam Bomber's girlfriend? Mm -hmm. But they're in love with each other. Why should she pull a mean trick like the dog nappy? Well, I'm in love with you, and I do mean things to you. Yeah, that's true. Why do you do them? Because I love you, man. Besides, they had a fight. <laughs> Wait a minute. Mrs. Unless I'm hearing things too. There are two dogs. One's a coloratura soprano, and the other is a basso profundo. Wait a minute, Nick. It's a full operatic ensemble. Laura, this, this can't be. This thing has affected our minds. We've done cooch party. Oh, one of the dogs is ringing our bell. Just a minute. Hiya, Nick. Banana no. I told you I'd have a dog for you. Got my voice around the floor like a pie. Hey, you dog, shut up. Hey, Spike, make them dogs afraid me. Don't they know who I am? Come in, banana. Let the dog rip in the hall. <laughs> Hello, Mrs. Charles. The banana nose never fails. I got the push, I think. So I heard. What made you do this? Oh, I ain't no dope. With these low odds on the atom bomber, there's going to be plenty in it for old banana nose when we find the doggy and the atom bomber wins the fight. Yeah, I see your angle. But Banana Nose, I thought you'd figured some gambler took the pooch. I checked on that angle. The hound was not hijacked. 
So I figured he was on the loose, since the dog society didn't pick him up. It isn't a him dog. It's a her. A tomato? Mm Mm-hmm. Jojo is a female. (laughs) Well, I'll be (laughs) doggone. I forget there was two kinds. I told them to pick up all the black and white mongoose they could find, no matter what kind of personalities they had. (laughs) Well, we'll bring the dogs in, and I'll have the atom bomber come down and see if he can identify one of them. Are you going to bring that mob of mongrels in here, Nicky? Well, what can we do, Nora? We've got to be good hosts. Well, you can stay here with them, Nick. I know what I'm going to do. Where are you going, Nora? To investigate my own angle on this dog napping. I'll call you up, darling. I'll sneak out the back way. Uh, Nora! Well, Nick, shall I bring him in? Oh, I guess so. <laughs> okay, you mug. Send then all the girls go. Good evening. Good evening. Are you Miss Lulu Laverne? I am she. Well, I'm Mrs. Nora Charles. Pleased to meet you, I think. Uh, entree. French. That means come in and also something expensive to eat in high-class continental dumps. It does? Yes. Yeah. Are you interested in culture? Well, I suppose so. Culture is my latest passion. Well, I thought Mr. Adam Baum Brickenhead was there. Oh. What do you know about it? He told me about you, Lulu. He did, did he? Mm-hmm. Well, whatever he said, it's a foul and delicious canary. You mean malicious canard? Oh, trying to outculture me, are you? No, Lulu. I'm just trying to find Mr. Adam Bomber's dog. Well, what did you come here for? Do I look like a dog cat? Don't answer that. Lulu, all day long, poor Mr. Adam Bomber's been trying to identify his dog. Hundreds of dogs have been brought to my house. So far, his hasn't turned up. Not even one of them poaches is Jojo? Not one. If he goes into the fight without Jojo, he'll just be killed. That's great. I know you took the dog. Oh, so I'm a dog thief now. The doorman of this apartment house saw you with the dog. And after the tip I gave him for Christmas. But he didn't see me with Jojo. He saw me with my own dog, Chi-Chi. He saw you with two dogs. That must have been the night he seen me with the atom bomber. The atom bomber isn't two dogs. He is so. You don't know him as good as I do. Lulu, you just say those things because you had a fight with him. Sure. Can you give me a better read? And on the day you had a fight, you took the dog out for a walk and you told him she ran away. He did. Why? Because we girls just didn't get along together. And besides, no man should love another female as much as he loves that dog, even if she has got a better pedigree than I got. Lulu, you're jealous of Jojo. Me? Jealous of a pup? What's she got? Dog skin. I got mink. Lulu, you know where that dog is, and I'm going to see that you return her. <laughs> you can't scare me. Hey, who are you calling? My husband. He'll make you confess. That's unfair. You can't turn a man loose on me. You can see I'm the type that men can melt. Nick. Good heavens, who answered the phone? Nick. Hello, Nora, baby. I thought the dogs answered the phone for a moment. Oh, well, they've done everything but that. Banana knows and his boys keep bringing me in by the dozen. Hey, hey, get out. Have you found Jojo among them? No. The atom bomber's here. He's dazed from the dogs and scared to go into the ring. Hey, don't fight. Nick, come up here to Lulu's place right away. I'm sure she's got the dog. Okay, Lulu's place. Uh, wait a minute. The atom bomber's got to rush to the fight now. Hey, bomber, you want to say something to your girl, Lulu? Yes. Yeah. Uh, hello, Lulu. I'm glad to hear it, Mr. Barber. But this is Nora. Lulu, come here and say something nice to him. He's got to rush to the fight now. Encourage him. I sure will. Hello. Barber? Lulu, I'm so miserable. Yes. And my best wish is that the champ should mighty in the first round. Lulu, what a wish. What are you complaining about? If you're croaking round one, you won't have to finish the fight. Goodbye. <laughs> Bomber has covered the camp with blood. <laughs> that is the atom bomber's blood. Oh, 
Nora and I have brought you to this beer parlor to see what you've done to the poor Adam Bomber. Yes, Lily, look at him. He looks terrible. Oh, that's the television set. It thinks the fact that Jeff... Folks, as you look at the face of the Adam Bomber, don't think your television set is broken. It's just what the champ did to him. Oh, boy, he's really a mess, eh? There's the bell, folks, and we're off for another round of slaughter. Here comes the Adam Bomber. He's giant right in the champ's right. Oh, stop him, Dad, Grandma! The bomber's tired of the champ's right, so he's aiming his head at the champ's left. Ah, ah. Oh, 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 the poor bomber! Nick, she's breaking down. I can't bear to see his ugly face falling like that. All right, I'll give you the poor. He's in a dark hotel. On a honeymoon with my dog. Come on, I'll show you where. Here's Jill, Jill. Thanks, Doc. Nick and Nora, can we still get to the fight on time? Yes, Lulu. Scooch has some ringside oh. seats for us, right near the atom bomber's corner. So this is Jojo. How do you like being a bride, Jojo? <laughs> Come on, you three gushing girls. We've got the rush. <laughs> Yes, he's resting between the rounds. Nora. Yes, dear. You sit here with Lulu. I'm going to take Jojo to the bomber's corner. All right. Hey, Scooch. <laughs> bomber. Look what I've got here. <laughs> hey, Scooch. Nick, Nick, don't bother me. We're trying to keep him conscious. I've got something that'll make him win the fight. Look, Nick, I ain't got time. This boy of mine needs everything but a blood transfusion. Scooch. I'll buy that half interest in your boy for two grand. Sold. I'll tell you the half above the waist. That's completely dead wood. It's a deal. Now let me talk to my half of my boy. Okay, okay, here. Bomber. Bomber, look what I've got under my arm. Jojo. My little doggy, Jojo. Yes, your girl Lou had her. She took her because she thought you loved her more than you loved her. That ain't true. I love my dog just as much as I love my girl. And Lulu loves you, too. And there she is. She came here to watch you win the championship. Lulu! Oh, boy, I'm going to kill that champ. I'm going to murder him. My fighting spirit is returned. Nothing can stop me now. Okay, I'm going back to our seat. Go in there and win, Bomber. Nick! Nick! I'm coming, baby. Did you tell the Bomber what happened? Yes, Nora. Did it do any good? Good. You just... Lulu, as soon as he saw you and the dog, he was practically resurrected. Resurrected? Is that good? It's going to be sensational. There's the bell. Look at him go. Stop him in the head, Bomber. Give him the old one, too. Oh, boy, there goes the bomber. Look at him swing. Yes. Look at him miss. Look at him miss. See, that wall up in the gym. Look how nicely he falls. Get up, Bomber. That's right, Bomber. Stay there and take a nice oh. rest. Oh. Take a rest, Bomber. Yes. He isn't resting, Nora. He's unconscious. Don't be silly being small. Yes. Get up, Bomber. Jojo, bark at him. He's firing. Yes. Nora, he was knocked out. But, but that's impossible. We did everything like they do in the movies, and it never ends this way. It's, it's a foul. Foul! Well, <laughs> I'm afraid the bomber is down for the count. Now, if Nikki and Nora are smart, they'll go on home and have themselves a cold, refreshing bottle of that blended, splendid Pat Blue Ribbon. The beer with a fresh, clean, sparkling flavor. You know, Pat Blue Ribbon is quite a home favorite with happily married couples. Just to mention a few, there's Mr. and Mrs. Gregory Peck, Mr. and Mrs. Bob Hope, Mr. and Mrs. Lawrence Melchior, and Miss Gladys Swarthout, and her husband, Mr. Frank Chapman. Now, these people can certainly afford the best of everything. And the fact that Pabst Blue Ribbon is served in their homes is a tribute to its quality. I could tell you about Pabst's 104 years of leadership in the art of brewing and explain how Pabst developed the science of blending. Yes, blending 33 fine brews to keep the same identical Blue Ribbon flavor and quality in bottle after bottle, year after year. But... I'd rather you'd simply taste it yourself. By tasting, by comparing, you'll understand why millions the world over have settled down to blended, blended half blue ribbon. And now for the conclusion of 
tonight's Thin Man Adventure. Hello, Nicky, darling. Where have you been? To see Scoot and pay him for my half of the bomber. Oh. How is he? Very happy. He wishes there were more people like me in the world and uh, less fighters like the bomber. That's not nice. The bomber really tried hard. Yeah, I know. The bomber says he would have won the fight if the champ didn't get in his way so much. I know. But isn't it isn't the bomber's fault if there was another man in the ring? <laughs> anyway, I'm glad to hear he's going to marry Lulu. When did you find that out? Oh, well, Lulu phoned a few minutes ago. Well, that's one match I hope he'll win. Nora! Hmm? Nora, darling, what are you knitting there? Uh, can't you guess? Why, it, it, it looks like a, a little garment. Nora, don't tell me. Yes, it's true. Jojo's going to have puppy. Well, then congratulate me. Why? <laughs> After what I went through with that dog, I practically feel like a father. <laughs> Yeah, looks like another hot night tonight. Mm. And if we can't sleep, I know just what to do now. Hmm? Go out again? No, <laughs> we'll get into too much trouble that way. We'll each have a glass of ice cold Pabst Blue Ribbon beer, and then I'll do this. Mm. And say good night, Nikki, darling. Be sure to listen next Tuesday night when Pants Blue Ribbon Beer brings you another happy, exciting Thin Man adventure with Les Tremaine and Claudia Morgan. The political season is upon us, and those flying the red colors have their promises. The politicians wearing blue have different promises. But those of us in the cryptid party have only one promise – to stay hidden and mind our own business. Don't let the political pundits, the candidates, the PACs, or your closed-minded brainwashed family and friends tell you who to vote for. You're smarter than that. That's why I'm telling you who to vote for. This November, pull the lever for Bigfoot and Mothman. Our new president, Bigfoot, won't make the same mistakes as humans have. Because he's not human, Bigfoot loves our country and you. So much so that he knows you have a better idea of how to run your life than he does. So he's staying out of your life. With Vice President Mothman, their new administration will do what no administration has done in the past. Absolutely nothing. Show your support for the Cryptid Party by grabbing your Bigfoot Mothman 2024 merchandise with campaign buttons and stickers, hats, shirts, tote bags, mugs, hoodies, giant tapestries, pillows, magnets, even clothes for your kids to get them into the spirit of the political season. This year, vote for someone you can trust in, believe in, even without scientific proof of their existence. A vote for Bigfoot and Mothman is a vote you can be proud to tell others about. Get your Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 merchandise now at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. Available in all sizes and colors, even red and blue if you want to confuse people about your party loyalties. The new Bigfoot and Mothman 2024 political campaign merchandise at WeirdDarkness.com slash shirts. $1,000 reward is being offered for information leading to the capture of a dangerous criminal. A complete description will be given on this true detective mystery, which follows in a moment. The case history you are about to hear is the actual report of an actual crime. Army Town. Into town evenings, every evening, hundreds of servicemen, warming, looking, seeking a few hours of recreation. 
Catering to the servicemen, roadhouses, Jerry's juke joints, gay night spots, and often in these pleasure palaces, trouble. Therefore, it was not unusual on this starlit, frosty evening, not considered unusual at all, when a neatly dressed young man and woman rushed into county hospital. Outside! Oh, nurse, please, quick, outside! He's dying. We found him beside the road. Now, nurse, come on. You don't have no time. The receiving nurse immediately into action. Orderlies, a stretcher summoned. From the back seat of the young couple's car, a young man. Easy, easy. Blood on his face, blood on his good quality clothing, stretchered, taken in, undressed, bathed, examined by the doctor in charge of receiving. Meanwhile, at the receiving nurse's desk. My name is Greg Saunders. No, miss, I don't know the man. I never saw him before tonight. The nurse insisting on filling out a card. Well, this is my wife, Ann. Ann May Saunders. We live at Kilo Drive, 119 Kilo Drive. Nurse, for the last time, we don't have any idea how he was hurt. Driving along, we found him beside the road. Maybe he was hit and run. But you got our address. Come on, hon. This is what we get for being a good Samaritan. You bet. Doctor phoning the sheriff, the time now past midnight. Sheriff C.D. Manning, efficient, unassuming, informed the boy might not last the night. Man. Man with a gun. With a gun. His name. His name, son. The white glare of the bed lamp over his face. Face pale, bloodless. A handsome young face in its early 20s. Son? The youth back into coma. The sheriff's chief deputy, James J.J. Beach, arriving. What was he trying to say? Well, that somebody shot him. First idea, he was a hit and run. Doc here found a slug in his chest. How'd he get here? Outside nurse says a nice-looking couple brought him. Claimed they found him beside the road. She took their names. Who was the youth? Why shot? Shot and left beside the road. Who was the gunman? Was the wound accidental, self-inflicted, or still most likely the result of foul play? In the patient's locker room now, Sheriff Manning, Chief Deputy J.J. Beach, going through the victim's clothes. Soiled, bloodstained, expensive. Suit, yeah. White shirt, dark tie, underwear, shoes, every label removed. No wallet, Sheriff. Gone. Only this, a buck and this. Crumpled up uh, ticket stamp. Mm. Local movie house. Hey, nurse, uh, put these under lock and key. Tell Dr. Harris to keep me informed. Come on, J.J., too late to see the Saunders couple now. Eight in the morning, I'll meet you at 119 Keeler Drive. That's near Domain Road. About two hours before 8 a.m., the handsome young John Doe dying, dying in coma. The case now moved to homicide, murder. Coroner A. B. B. Heyman called. Coroner's inquest. Inquest presented with the evidence of a 38 caliber battered and spent slug. Put it in a box of cotton, coroner. Maybe our ace in the hole. Let's move, J.J. The Saunders. Keep her dry. Make yourself comfortable, Sheriff. Well, first, I want to thank you folks for what you did last night. Well, it was nothing what anybody do. I was driving along when I saw what looked like a bundle of old clothes. Backing up, I put my headlights to it, got the shot. And I lied. Yeah, I guess you did. You got the time to uh, ride out and show us where you found the victim? Yeah, I think so. Call the mill, huh, and get it straight for once, huh? Mac is the foreman, nobody else. Mac, now I'll be late. Out on the road? It must have been around here. Well, if you're sure, just a few mingled footprints, J.J. There's some tire tracks, but none legible enough to be worth checking time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no gun, no empty cartridge in these road weeds. Jay, I wager one thing. Our victim wasn't shot here. How can you? Not enough blood on the ground. His clothes are pretty well covered with it, so I have a hunch he was shot elsewhere and just dumped here. Oh, I hear this ain't no backcountry road. A lot of traffic moves on this road. Thanks, Saunders. You can go to work at the mill now. Well, that's just another of the questions, J.J. We got to answer. <laughs> On 
On the chance that someone might have seen a car parked on the highway while the body was being dumped, if the body actually had been dumped, each and every house within a mile of the spot where the body had been found by Saunders visited. The result? Nothing. Morning, news of the murder broadcast with the cooperation of the local radio station. Soon, large numbers flocking to the local mortician's chapel, asking to see the body. Suddenly, a young woman bursting into tears, fleeing into the hall. Chief Deputy J.J. Beach pursuing, given the following statement, quote, I know him. His name is Charles Fergus. He was a real nice boy. The last time I saw him, he was so cheerful, so full of life. I never dreamed anything like this would, could happen to him, unquote. Sheriff and Chief Deputy into fast action now to confirm this witness's identification. The whole small town question. Reiteration from witness after witness as to the high caliber of the murdered young man. Taverns, roadhouses, barbecue joints visited. The only thing learned, Charles Fergus's good looks and classy clothes attracted the girls. Made many less fortunate local youth envious, not a few sore. But from not one source was there evidence giving reason to believe that Fergus had gone out of his way to attract women and girls. I think there's the angle we should work on, Jay. Fergus's girlfriend. Everybody says he knew how to behave himself, but he could have gotten mixed up with some woman whose boyfriend played rough. You mean some floozy? No, or... I mean some nice girl. Perhaps a married woman. Still the victim's hometown. A pal of Charles Fergus located... A mill hand. Well, I don't know I can help you. Reluctant, as you heard at first, but after urging from the sheriff, giving the matter thought. Now you mention it, uh, I once heard some talk about uh, Charlie seeing a married one a few times back in town, but I didn't pay no attention to it. Asked why not? Well, I figured it was loose talk because there were too many single girls itching to date with him without him fooling with no man's wife. No, I, I don't know her name. I I don't want to get mixed up in no investigation. Like Charlie Fergus, didn't you? Afraid? Oh, I don't think so. You mean I, I get what Fergus got? Well, I... I reckon I might be able to point out the lady's house. You drive me back. Taken to the bigger town... Right, uh, two houses down from where you stopped your car. It's the white frame with the yellow shutters. Sure, that's Greg Saunders' house. deputy off balance. Sheriff's office after the mill worker had been returned. Was it a crazy coincidence that Saunders and his missus accidentally discovered one of her friends seriously wounded on the highway? Hmm. Or did Saunders shoot Fergus in a jealous temper over his wife? Yeah. And why did he risk taking the dying man to county hospital? And why is she, Mrs. Saunders, clammed up so tight? Don't make sense. Uh, nothing about this case makes sense, Jay. On your way out, send Officer Enders in. I understand he's got some information on the case. From Officer Enders, the following report, quote, I located a gas station man who remembers seeing Charles Fergus in his place the murder night about 9 p.m. As Fergus leaves his station, a black sedan drives in, the driver calling to him. After a few words, which the gas station owner couldn't hear, Fergus got into the car and it drove away. I asked the owner if he recognized the car and driver. He told me it was Greg Saunders, unquote, end of Officer Anders' report. A complete check into Saunders' background. Thirty minutes later, fast car to 119 Keeler Drive. Sheriff going inside, Chief Deputy Beach directing a house-to-house from the neighbors outside. Inside. Yes, I think it's time we had a talk, Mrs. Saunders. Now, you just admitted you'd known Fergus for some time. Yes. Was there trouble between him and your husband? I don't know. Your husband jealous of Fergus, was he? Yes, yes, he was. But he certainly had no reason to be. Charlie and I were just good friends. 
When Greg got back from prison camp, somebody told him Charlie's walking me home, been walking me home from that mill, and that's all it was. That's what started all the trouble, and it nearly drove my husband out of his mind. Mind if I look around? Somebody made attempts to scrub it up. Maybe I ought to get a technical man down to make an analysis of these spots. Huh? What say, Mrs. Saunders? I think Charlie Fergus was shot in this house. Am I right? <laughs> You're right. I tried. I tried to stop it, but I couldn't. Ever since it happened, I've tried to get up enough nerve to tell the police, but I was too scared. Love your husband. I don't know why I wasn't killed, too, unless it was because Greg wanted to punish me this way. It all started after Greg got back from prison. You know about him in prison. Didn't. Till a little less than an hour ago. Follow me. He was sent to the roads. But go on. Got back. Jailbird. He went around checking Checking on me, me, his wife, trying to find out if I dated anyone while he was up in the prison farm, which wasn't true. It isn't true. Jealous, insanely jealous, brooding, kept brooding over it day after day. And that night, shortly after I went to bed, Craig came into the bedroom and woke me up. I was shocked to see Charlie Fergus standing there beside me, beside my bed, Greg on the other side of him. Greg with a gun. Greg ordered Charles to talk. And he made me get up and stand beside Charlie. Greg asked me if I knew him, and I said I didn't. What happened then? I saw Greg was in a dangerous mood, and I thought if we admitted knowing each other, well, maybe he'd let Charlie go without more trouble. So I pleaded with Charlie to admit we were friends. He finally told my husband, all right, he said, I know your wife, but there's nothing between... That instant, Greg fired straight at him. I screamed. I think. When I came to, Greg, in the meantime, dragged Charlie out into the yard and into the car. Greg made me dress and go along. First he put poor Charlie off beside the road. Then I, I, I don't know why I was too frightened to say a word. He had a change of heart and he put him back in the car and went 60 to the county hospital. He made up that story about finding them beside the road. I kept quiet. I, I was afraid of my own life, even in the hospital. He had one hand on the gun. He kept pushing close to me on that side. Well, you don't have to be afraid anymore. Where is he now? It's almost shift time. He'll be picked up when he comes outside. Collard at the mill gate. Greg Saunders taken to sheriff's quarters. Defiant. Look, Sheriff, I told you all I know about this case. When are you going to stop pestering me? First, I want to know why you didn't tell the nurse about the bullet in Fergus's body when you took him to the hospital. Well, how was I to know he'd been shot? Shot him, didn't you? Look, what are you trying to do? Frame me? You pin something on me? Because I'm an ex-con? Well, that doesn't mean that you can set me up for this job. Your wife told us what happened, Saunders. No use now to lie. No. Oh. Oh, so that's it, huh? She's wanted a divorce, and I wouldn't oblige. With me back in the can, she can... And she can get rid of me on two years' separation. Well, she's lying her head off. But a lot of good it'll do. You can't prove a thing against me. Take him away, deputy. <laughs> Search now of 119 Curla Drive with a search warrant. Technical state police men removing scrapings from the bedroom floor, finding a 38 revolver under a mattress in a back room. The weapon rushed to state laboratory. And now, a lull setting in. The lull broken by a positive kickback on the gun. Greg Saunders brought up from sheriff's detention. They had it from the beginning, Saunders. You knew your wife couldn't testify against you. And without her, we had no case. 
We got one now. Uh-huh. The gun. That gun right there before your eyes. You can get set for a ride to the gas box, boy. We can prove this gun killed Charlie Fergus. So what say now? Okay. I'm licked. Yeah, yeah, I shot Fergus. But I had a right. Has a man a right to defend his home or hasn't he the right? Well, I was in stir going batty. This guy was hanging around my wife trying to make time. When I got home and I found out, well, I guess I went off my rocker. Well, that night I spotted him walking. I pulled over to the curb. I forced him into my car. I drove him to my house. And after I got a confession, I shot him so he won't mash any more married women. Confession of what? I understand all he ever did was walk your wife home. Oh, don't you start. I intended to leave him beside the road, but I couldn't do it. I still had no right to let him die. That's the way I felt about it. So I rushed him to the hospital. And I gave the nurse the story about finding him beside the road. Now, there isn't any doubt about that. You know, this may sound strange. But I'm sorry that I shot that guy. I must have been out of my mind. Substantiated statement that Fergus had had relations with his wife, Greg Saunders might have pleaded the unwritten law. There was none. At trial, consequently, Greg Saunders threw himself on the mercy of the court and received a sentence of life imprisonment. Making a successful escape from a road gang, he voluntarily returned and surrendered. He is serving his sentence now. Except for the use of fictitious names and places, this has been a real story of a real crime, solved by real people with a real criminal brought to justice. But be on the alert. A vicious criminal is at large and may be in your neighborhood. As editor of True Detective magazine, I offer a thousand dollar reward for information leading to the capture of Henry Randolph Mitchell, one month from the date of this broadcast and as a direct result of listening to this broadcast. And now, here are the details regarding the wanted criminal. Henry Randolph Mitchell, wanted by the Federal Bureau of Investigation on a charge of bank robbery, is the only one of the original 1950 FBI list of ten most wanted criminals who is still at large today. Henry Randolph Mitchell is 62 years of age, 5 feet 5 and a half inches in height, and weighs about 155 pounds. He has graying brown hair, brown eyes, and a ruddy complexion. The fugitive has the following marks of identification. A one-inch scar on the inside of his left wrist, a small cut scar on the inside edge of his left eyebrow, a crooked, stiff little finger on his right hand, and a mole on his right cheek. His previous occupations include clerk, machinist, and porter. Mitchell is said to frequent racetracks and is a reckless gambler. He is believed to be armed and should be approached with caution. If located, notify Director J. Edgar Hoover, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Washington, D.C. Do not call your local radio station, but notify Director J. Edgar Hoover, Federal Bureau of Investigation, Washington, D.C. Then get in touch with the editor of True Detective for the $1,000 reward. Algernon Blackwood's novella The Willows was originally published as part of Blackwood's 1907 collection The Listener and Other Stories. It is one of his best-known works and has been influential on a number of later writers. In fact, horror author H. P. Lovecraft considered the story The Willows to be the finest supernatural tale in English literature. And you can hear the story The Willows by Algernon Blackwood absolutely free. 
Visit the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com to find it. The Willows by Algernon Blackwood at WeirdDarkness.com slash audiobooks. Plus, science fiction adventures from the world of tomorrow, the years beyond 2000 A.D. 2000 Plus presents The Rocket and the Skull. Have you heard from Colonel Bradbury yet? No, sir. I've been trying to for ten minutes. We'll try again. Yes, sir. B for base to R for rocket. B for base to R for rocket. Come in, R for rocket. Every time Bradbury is more than five minutes late, I get the jitters. He's too important for this project not to know where he is every moment. Yes, sir. B for base to R for rocket. Come in, R for rocket. Try a scanner beam. He should be on the all-clear level out of Detroit. Yes, sir. B for base to R for rocket. Come in, R for rocket. We can't afford to have anything happen to him. The first experiment is being conducted tomorrow morning. Bradbury is the only man who knows every step of the routine. B for base to R for rocket. Come in, R for rocket. You're not getting him. Cut the scanner and return to standard beam. Yes, sir. Come in, R for rocket. He should have left an hour earlier, and he could have taken a scheduled flight. But no, he has to work up to the last minute and then fly his own plane to get here in time. B for base to R for rocket. R for rocket. B for base. This is R for rocket. Oh, there he is, sir. Beam contact at 14 over 6. He's about 80 miles out of Detroit. Give me that mic. Brad, this is General Hilton. Are you receiving me? Go ahead, General. What happened? We couldn't contact you. That's the trouble with my stabilizer. Thought I might have to land. But it's okay now. Are you sure? We can't have anything happen to you. Don't worry, sir. The first experiment is being conducted tomorrow morning. Everything is ready for you. Good. The entire general staff will be there. Maybe the president himself. Is there anything you want me to have done before you come in? Fred, anything you want done? Hello, R for rocket. I'm not getting a response. B for base to R for rocket. Come in, R for rocket. That's funny, sir. He was receiving clear as a bell. Come in, R for rocket. He said the stabilizer had been acting up. That can mean a lot of trouble at 700 miles an hour. What's that? Automatic distress signal, sir. Coming from Colonel Bradbury's plane. Hello, Crash Central. This is B for base. Automatic distress signal coming in on channel 420. Colonel Bradbury flying a rocket jet X-93. Hey, it stopped. B for base to crash central. Automatic signal cease to register at beam contact 16 over 8. Carry out emergency crash procedures. Repeat, Colonel Bradbury's rocket jet X-93 has crashed on beam position 16 over 8. Check out. I'm glad you were able to get here, General. We're going to operate very shortly. I hear it's a miracle he's alive. It will be more of a miracle if he's alive one hour from now. You've got to save him. He's an important man. Yes, the White House called and so did the Pentagon. We know Colonel Bradbury's important, but a shattered is very difficult. I know you'll do all you can. Stay right here, General. We'll keep you informed. Well, it's out of our hands. I have a report from Crash Central, sir. Well? Apparently, Colonel Bradbury used the catapult parachute just before the plane crashed. Otherwise, he would have been killed instantly. When he was catapulted up, his chute didn't open. He fell into a group of trees. Poor Brad. 
It might have been better if he'd stayed in the ship. You heard what the doctor said? Yes, sir. A shattered skull. The one brain we need to carry out the experiment tomorrow, and this is what had happened. Rose. Clam. Sponge. Scalpel. Not my brown earth. Clams. Systolic. 80 over 40. The patient thinking, sir. More oxygen. Yes, sir. Patient responding, sir. Good. Scalpel. Sponge. Clams. Scalpel. I'm completely out, Lieutenant. Have you a cigarette? Yes, sir. Here you are. Thanks. All this waiting. Waiting. It's been more than an hour. Brain surgery is very delicate, sir. May take another hour or even more. You carried out my orders to postpone the experiment? Yes, sir, until further notice. If Brad doesn't live, we'll have to start another man all over. May set the project back a year, and the year could be dangerous. Oh, you look surprised, Lieutenant. You don't know what this experiment's all about, do you? Well, I see the code name for it on the paper, sir, but it never has a description. After all, it's marked top secret. Maybe it's about time you were told with Brad upstairs hanging on to life by a thread. I'm going to need a bright young man to give me some important assistance. You've come through with pretty good colors these last many hours. Thank you, sir. Well, we'll talk more about it in a little while. Right now, I'm going to stretch out and try to rest. I'm about done in. If I hear anything, I'll awaken you, sir. I don't expect I'll sleep. Not with the fate of the world depending on a surgeon's knife upstairs. Done. Clam. Adjust the light, nurse. Scalpel. Probe. Yes, quite a bone fragment. Sponge. Clamps. Systolic, 70 over 40. Oxygen again. It's pure oxygen now, sir. Nurse, prepare for transfusion. 60 over 40. Patient thinking, sir. Well, that's right, nurse. Go ahead, Dr. Bone. Hurry. Condition same, doctor. He's getting the transfusion. Let me help you, Dr. Bowen. There. Well? Systolic. 80 over 40. Good. He's responding. All right. Scalpel. Probe. Lamp. Just too nervous even to rest. How long has it been? Almost two hours, sir. Two hours. Just about now the general staff would be arriving and Brad would be checking everything for the experiment in the morning. Lieutenant, have you any guess about that experiment, about what it is? Well, I... My guess is it's, it's about a new kind of aircraft. Oh, why do you say that? Well, just because it's an Air Force project. Well, I wouldn't say you were warm, but you aren't cold either. The experiment and the reason it's so important concerns a rocket to the moon. A rocket to the moon? But... But why, sir? Why send one there? Who controls the moon controls the world. If we had rockets on the moon, we could compel peace on Earth. The United Nations would press a button and wipe any aggressor off the face of the Earth. That means space travel. You don't mean that we... No, have... Lieutenant, we haven't found the way to send rocket ships with human beings through space. Not yet, anyway. But the rocket we're experimenting with is a two-way rocket. It can land on the moon and return from the moon, all electronically controlled from the Earth. Sounds fantastic, sir. Oh, it's quite feasible, I assure you. But we have reason to believe that we're not the only nation thinking of this. Time is of the essence. Colonel Bradbury knows more about operating these rockets than any man alive. And just on the verge of the experiment, this has to happen. Shh. Quiet. General Hilton. Yes? Uh, Dr. Rizzo asked me to take a message down to you from the operating room. Brad. He's dead, isn't he? Uh, no, General. He's still hanging on. Dr. Riggio says that he now has a 30% chance of surviving. Thank God. Part of Colonel Bradbury's skull has been fragmented. A head plate will have to be put on. Because of the size of the area, a new metal alloy plate will be used. It will take at least five or six more hours. Dr. Riggio suggests you go home, General, where you'll be more comfortable. The hospital will phone you if anything happens. <laughs> coming 
out of it. Uh, uh, Colonel Bradbury, can uh, you hear me? Uh, this is Dr. Origio. Uh, Nurse, open the blinds a little. Mm. Yeah, good. I'll ease his back with the pillow. I'll hold him. Uh, uh, fine, thank you. Uh, Ten days since the operation, and he's just now coming out of it. He's a strong man. Almost any other person would have died. Colonel Bradbury. Mm -hmm. Colonel Bradbury, can you hear me? The the base rocket. Our our rocket. He's beginning to talk. Uh Nurse, have Dr. Keyes come in at once. Stabilizer off. Our rocket. General Hilton. Well... It's all right, Colonel. Take it easy. You call for me. The nurse said he was coming out of it. He's talking erratically. Typical stuff. Uh, 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 rocket base. And that sort of thing. Well, it's technical jargon. Air Force lingo. Mars. Martians. Mars? Mars? Uh, uh, Martians? Well, they use all sorts of code names. Mars is probably one of them. I think in about 48 hours, he ought to be out of shock completely. We can call General Hilton. Tell him to come over day after tomorrow. Uh, 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 Take it easy, Colonel. Six months, and you ought to be in pretty good shape. Uh, Nurse, keep him comfortable. Dr. Keyes and I will leave now. Uh, Rocket. Stabilizer off. Wrong. Something wrong. (laughs) Must call General. Call General Hilton. Mars. Martian. Mars. back to me, please. Memorandum to General Staff. One, the new experiment is tentatively planned for April 3rd, 2000 plus six. Two, all security measures have been taken. Three, although severely handicapped by Colonel Bradbury's absence, newly trained specialists will endeavor to fill the gap. Anything more, General? No, no, Lieutenant. Uh... (laughs) Sorry, I should say no, Captain. You like that extra bar? I certainly do, sir. Well, you earned it, Bob. You've been a great help to me. Okay, note the memo is top secret and send it facsimile to the Pentagon. Oh, I'll take it. Never mind. You know, Hilton? Who? The President. Oh, yes, Mr. President. Of course, sir. Well, I've just prepared a memorandum, but that's only two weeks, Mr. President. We assumed about 60 days. Oh. Yes, sir. We'll work day and night to do it. Yeah, thank you, Mr. President. Captain, change the date in the first paragraph of the memo. The new experiment is to take place in two weeks. General, that's almost impossible. I know it, and you know it. But there's one man who doesn't know it, and he says it's got to be done. <laughs> I'm not disposed to argue with the President of the United States. <laughs> I'd like to double-check some of my notes on Colonel Bradbury with you. Of course, Doctor. Now, this afternoon, the General's coming to see him. But, but uh, Colonel Bradbury, he needs months of convalescence. And he's not too lucid. Now, that's the point. He's not too lucid, but weak as he is, he talks normally for a while. Makes sense. And then that strange reaction sets in. I've observed it myself. Three times. Well, head injury cases are quite unpredictable. Perhaps, but according to my notes, Colonel Bradbury's strange reaction has taken place always either at 10 a.m. or 5 p.m. Of the three instances I've observed, two have been at 10, one at 5. Mm, Well, that is unusual. And in each instance, well, I can see him now in my mind's eye. He's sitting on a long bed, talking quite sensibly, although in a weak, weak voice, suddenly he becomes tense. He grimaces as if he's head were in pain. He even clutches the bedclothes with tight fists. He appears to be rigid. Mm. Then, after a few minutes, invariably comes a flood of disjointed, disconnected sentences about messages, emergency, crisis, fate of the world, and Mars. Our General Hilton is going to visit the Colonel this afternoon at about five o'clock. And you expect the Colonel to have another uh, strange reaction? I don't know. Well, surely General Hilton realizes that a man who's had severe surgery can't... I can't tell what the General will realize, but my fear is that he may feel the Colonel is not improving as well as he might 
And he may call in other doctors. But we're doing everything humanly possible. That is the irony of the situation. I could have killed the colonel in surgery. It would have been very easy. But where important government officials are concerned, I get worried. If we ever were investigated carefully, they might find out who you and I really are. And that would be dangerous. Very dangerous, indeed. In here? Thank you, nurse. Understand you wanted to see me. I came as soon as I could. And... Sit. Sit down. Sure, Brad. Don't worry about me. Brad, we're rescheduling the experiment. Do you feel up to answering a few questions about the experiment? Something to tell you. Sure, Brad. Sure, I know there's a lot you want to tell me, but when well, you're still a sick guy, so... Suppose I just ask you a few questions and you answer them yes or no. That'll save your energy. Time. What time is it? Why, it's uh, a few seconds before five o'clock. Why? Coming. Message coming. Message coming? What message? Trying to tell you. Couldn't tell anyone else. Mars. Martians. Mars. Martians. Trying to tell me what? <laughs> Brad. For heaven's sake. <laughs> What's the matter, Brad? <laughs> Nurse. A doctor. Something's happening to Colonel Bradbury. <laughs> Hurry. Hurry. Colonel, Dr. Riggio, can you hear me? Mars, Mars. General Hilton is here, too. You remember? I'm sorry, General. Strange things happen to the human mind. Uh, His skull is a metal plate. Uh, Mars. Calling Mars. Earth calling Mars. It's like a fit. Look at him. Agent reporting. Urgent. Calling Mars. You are received. Mars receiving your call. Proceed. Colonel Bradbury. Colonel. The nurse will try a hypo. Get one for me, please. Uh, 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 the moon experiment will take place in 12 Earth days. Uh, uh, Thank you, Nan. Now I'll inject. There. You should relax in a moment. I am very commanded. Here are your further orders. The experiment must fail. You are to be certain that all tests are taken. There. I have released his tension. He'll sleep now. Be all right when you wake him. So what happened to him, Doctor? I'm not certain, General, but in a few days, we may be able to tell more. I know you're doing everything possible, Doctor, and we're grateful for your saving Brad's life. But mightn't it be wise to call in some specialists, some other doctors for consultation? There's so much information and advice we need from Colonel Bradbury. Call in other doctors? Well, General, I don't know that that's necessary. It's so strange watching him, almost as if he were listening to something. You know... Now that I think of it, he did say something about a message. Do you think there's any connection? I hardly think so, General. After all, we didn't hear anything. No, no. I'm afraid it was just the erratic talk of a sick and injured brain. General, you really went through an experience watching the colonel like that. Captain, he was almost in a fit. Had some crazy idea he was getting messages. Messages? Yes, hallucinations. He was off his rocker for a while. I'm afraid I was a little brusque with Dr. Reggio. He's a fine man, but I'd feel better if some other medicals looked at Brad, too. Arrange for some specialist from Army Medical to examine him, will you, Captain? Yes, sir. I'll do it promptly. And one thing more. On the experiment file, you'll find your... General Hilton's office. Uh, one moment, please. For you, sir. Pentagon, intelligence section. Intelligence? Well. Hello. General Hilton. Yes. Yes. Are you certain? Have the president and the chief of staff been informed? 
Good. Yes, I'll be over in 15 minutes. Right. Order my car, Captain. Things are happening. Yes, sir. General Hilton's car stand by at west entrance. What thing, sir? Intelligence reports that the Eastern Alliance is definitely planning a moon rocket for blast off in six days. You know what that means if they get there before the United Nations. Six days, and we will be ready for 14 days. We really wanted three months. That's right. But how? Somehow they must have found out about our experiment and have agents that feed for some of our vital data. That's what the emergency meeting is about. Well, your car's ready, General. Good luck. We're going to need it, Captain. We're going to need it. Keys. Dr. Keys. Have you heard? What is it? Some other doctors are examining Colonel Bradbury. Yes, I just met them. What? I... Of course, I gave them permission. I had no choice. General Hilton requested it yesterday. Who are they? That's just it. Army medical. Army. How you can be so cold and calculating in surgery and so nervous now, I cannot understand. Your record here is flawless. Your operation on Bradbury is superb. No suspicion will attach to you or to me. If we conduct ourselves in a normal and professional manner, what is the risk? That they are the army. Now that means an intelligence section. They have routines about these things. We have no choice but to keep up appearances. I know, I know. But if they ever find out that we are the agents of the Eastern Alliance, that we have masterminded the theft of certain moon rocket data... They will be ruthless, Dr. Keyes. Ruthless. General Hilton's office. Oh, I'm sorry, the general isn't here. This is his aide. No, sir, I, I don't know when he'll return. I suggest you place the information on our private facsimile line in code. Our extension is 83. I'll then give the papers to the general when he arrives. Yes, sir. I'll turn the facsimile line on now, sir. We can receive it at once. Thank you. radio waves. At least that's the theory of the Army Medical Examiner. But, but the Martians, they want to stop the moon rocket. Enemies from another world. No, Colonel, you can't really believe that. You, you must have misunderstood. The real enemies are the Eastern Alliance. But their agents have been caught. Their moon project won't take place for a long time as a result. Now, you just take it easy, sir. <laughs> the Army's going to track down that wavelength that bothers your head. Then you recuperate peacefully. 
Captain True. Oh, excuse me, sir. It's almost five o'clock. I, I've got to be going, sir. Just take it easy, please. message to Mars on the regular wavelength at five o'clock. You'll have to use the alternate wavelength. I will submit a report explaining how our communications were discovered. But you can report this. The Eastern Alliance agents have been captured by the Americans. This reduces the chances of the Earth sending a moon rocket from two to only one. I will see to it that that one does not succeed. Are you positive you can execute this plan? Without question. Go on. You may report to my superiors on Mars that their observation base on the moon is safe from discovery. Mars will continue to be the only planet controlling outer space. That is all. It shall be reported. I just played that facsimile message in my office. Came as quickly as I could. Now, what on earth is happening? Why, nothing on earth is happening, General. Now, what are you talking about? Well, I mean, everything's all right now, sir, isn't it? The Eastern Alliance has been taken care of, and there's reason to believe Colonel Bradbury's weird hallucinations won't recur anymore. Oh, well, those are the two best pieces of news I've heard all day. Captain, I don't know what I'd do without you. Thank you, sir. I just try to do the best I can for my country. Next week, another exciting adventure from the world of tomorrow, from the years beyond 2000 A.D. Be sure to listen. 2000 Cast is produced by Dreyer and Renoson Productions, Incorporated. In today's cast, Arnold Robertson portrayed General Hilton, Will Griffiths was the lieutenant, Gregory Morton was Dr. Riggio, Matt Poland was Dr. Colonel Bradbury, and Merrill Jones was Dr. Keyes. <laughs> The orchestra was conducted by Emerson Buckley, music composed by Elliot Jacoby. Sound, Walt Shaver and Adrian Penner. Engineer, Bob Albrecht. This is Ken Marvin speaking. The teacher was Sam Starr. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. From Hollywood, Jackie Cooper in The Unexpected.
The unexpected. The unexpected. Life is filled with the unexpected, romantic, tragic, and mysterious endings to our most ordinary actions. Dreams come true, or dreams are shattered by sudden twists of fate in The Unexpected. But first, a word from your announcer. Jackie Cooper, famous motion picture and stage star in Museum, a drama of the unexpected. That's what it was, a museum, old and decayed. Row after row of paintings, long, narrow hallways of statues and tapestries, and rooms filled with worn-out, worm-eaten furniture. It wasn't a place to live in, it was just a collection of antiques. And the people there had grown cold and impersonal and heartless, like everything else in the house. They were antiques, too. That's why I hated the place. Hated every moment I had to stay there. And hated myself for staying. Stephen, come here, Stephen. Yes, Miss Thompson. I want you to polish the armor in the upstairs hallway. It's become very dull, and I noticed a speck of rust this morning. I'll take care of it. I don't see why I have to remind you of these matters... Why can't you show a little initiative? I'm sorry. When you finish with the armor, then clean the china in the showcase under the stairway. Hasn't been washed in months. Yes, ma'am. Stephen, just a minute. Yes? Aren't you happy here in my home? If you aren't, you can get out. It doesn't make any difference that I've looked after you since you were a child. Treated you as if you were my own son. You needn't feel any obligation toward me. You can leave this place any time you choose. Where would I go? I really have no idea. Now go upstairs and get me a book or a magazine. I want something to read. Well, do as I tell you, Stephen. I don't like to be kept waiting. Yes, Miss Thompson. I'll be right back. Oh, oh look out, you blundering fool. I, what's the matter? Oh, you stupid boy. Can't you watch where you're going? You nearly knocked over that Ming vase. Don't you know it's priceless? Why, if anything happened to that, I'd... Well, I, I don't know what I'd do. I'm sorry. Someday you'll be sorry too late, Stephen. Just remember that. And that's the way it was, day after day. I suppose Miss Thompson was nice to me in her way, but she kept me in that awful house until I thought I couldn't stand it for another hour. A hundred times I started to run away. There was no place to go. She knew that. And I'd given up hoping that I'd ever leave Glenwood. Till that morning when Mr. Clinton, her personal secretary, walked up behind me and twittered in my ear. Stephen, how would you like to leave this house? What do you mean, Mr. Clinton? Well, I've been thinking about you. There isn't much of a life here at Glenwood for a young man. You ought to be with people your own age, having a little fun... And maybe going to school somewhere. Mm, great chance I've got. Now, don't be bitter, Stephen. Miss Thompson agrees with me. Uh, her doctor has advised a change of climate, so she's going to close up the place and move north for the fall. You mean it, Mr. Clinton? Of course I mean it. So, if things work out, in a few weeks you'll be in college. College? That's wonderful. I, well, gee, I, I just can't believe it. It's too good to be true. 
Gee, thanks for telling me, Mr. Clinton. Thanks a lot. I... Oh. The vase. Oh, that I, was very I careless see of you, Mr. Clinton. Very careless. But... I don't know what Miss Thompson will say. It was one of her favorite pieces. Well, you, you're not going to tell her, are you, Mr. Clinton? She'd never forgive me. She, she'd never let me go to college if she found out. You won't tell her, will you? My dear boy, I have a responsibility to Miss Thompson. Well, I'm the one who broke it. It's up to me to say something, if, if there's anything to be said. Don't you know, Stephen, that the man who conceals knowledge of a crime is just as guilty as the man who commits the oh, crime? Oh, it wasn't any crime. It was just an accident. Well, we'll let Miss Thompson decide about that. Don't argue with me, Stephen. Mr. Clinton has told me exactly what happened. I didn't mean to knock it over, Miss Thompson. I was just excited about going to college. Well, you can curb your pleasure now. You mean you aren't going away? Oh, yes. Yes, I am. You're... you're not taking me with you? I should hardly think so, Stephen. You're not going anywhere until you learn to conduct yourself like a gentleman. But no... that's not fair. Not a bit fair. It was just an old flower pot. You're quite right. It was a very old flower pot. And it was worth a great deal more than money. But I don't expect you to understand that, Stephen. Not yet. Oh, I understand, all right. I understand that all this junk around here means more to you than people, or their feelings and desires, even their lives. That will do, Stephen. You just don't want to hear the truth, but it is the truth, and you know it. The only thing in the world that matters to you is this house and the vases and paintings and furniture. Stephen! This isn't a house. It's a museum. And you aren't a person, Miss Thompson. No, not really. You're just a statue without feelings like everything else in this place. Thank you, Stephen. Now I know how you feel about me and about my things. Yes, you know. When your parents died, Stephen, I thought I could rear you. Instill a love of beauty and fine art and craftsmanship. It's obvious I haven't succeeded. But I won't give up quite so easily. I think there's still hope for you, Stephen. And so, while Mr. Clinton and I are up north, I'm going to permit you to remain at Glenwood. I'm going to stay here. You don't have to. You're always free to leave, Stephen. Yeah, of course, if you should decide to remain, perhaps then you'll learn a true appreciation of fine art. One must live with art in order to understand it. I'll stay, Miss Thompson. Oh, yes, I'll stay. I thought you would. Well, I'll, I'll tell the caretaker he won't be needed. You'll uh, be able to look after everything, won't you, Stephen? Yes, I'll look after everything. <laughs> So I stayed on at Glenwood, all through the end of that long, hot summer, alone, with only the smell of old furniture and painted canvas for company. As the days went by, I realized I could never break free from Glenwood. I was really trapped now, caught forever, in a maze of dust and old brocade and stained glass. There wasn't any way out. I was sure of that. Until one afternoon, when I saw a chance to get out. I was working in the garden when I first noticed it. A faint, pungent odor. Smoke. Yeah, something was burning. Inside the house, a fire had broken out. I ran through the front door into the main drawing room and stopped suddenly as I saw what had happened. A little pile of oil rags I'd been using to clean some of the portraits had caught on fire. I don't know how it started exactly. Maybe the sun had been magnified by the curved glass and one of the showcases until it burned through the inflammable cloth. Anyway, by the time I got there, little tongues of flames were licking up an old French tapestry, eating it hungrily in small, dainty bites. I stood there for a moment, watching the tapestry disappear. Then I woke up. There was still time to save the house, so I hurried into the kitchen for a bucket of water and raced back to the living room. Oh, it was still just a harmless little blaze. One pailful would have put it out. I raised the bucket and held it back, ready to throw the water against the wall. Then I hesitated. Why should I save the house? All these antiques and priceless paintings. What did they mean to me? Nothing but misery and unhappiness. Let them burn. I didn't care. Let them burn. 
I set the bucket on the floor and watched the fire, fascinated as it grew like a boa constrictor, getting bigger as it devoured more and more of the wall. As I started to back out of the room, I had a sharp pang of conscience. Miss Thompson didn't carry insurance. She always said there wasn't enough money in the world to cover the value of the priceless objects the house contained. She'd lose everything she owned in the fire. Well, that wasn't my worry. I didn't owe her anything. I never had. One of the ceiling beams came crashing down beside me, and I knew I had to get out of there and get out fast. So I ran down the hall, the heat following on my heels. Out the open door and across the garden. Now I felt cool, calm, and unexcited. Behind me, the dying house chuckled and laughed as a fire embraced it in unrelenting arms. And with a final scream, the roof crashed and settled to its doom. The museum was gone. Burned up. I was free. Free at last. I'd never have to look at that house again. I had escaped it forever. You think the story is over, don't you? But wait. Fate takes a hand. Wait for the unexpected. Now for the surprising conclusion of Museum, a Hamilton Whitney production starring Jackie Cooper, written by Robert Libet and Frank Burt, and directed by Frank K. Danzig. It was the next day before I could get a call through to Mr. Clinton, and when I finally did talk to him, he didn't give me a chance to mention the fire. He had something much more important on his mind. I am so glad you called me, Stephen. I've been trying to reach you for several hours. Miss Thompson... Uh, what about Miss Thompson? You must be brave, Stephen. Miss Thompson passed on last night. It was very sudden. A heart attack. You... You mean she's dead? Yes. That's why I've been trying to call you. And uh, I don't suppose I should mention this yet. But you're a very wealthy man, Stephen. But... Uh, you but see, I, I, I... I know about the will. Miss Thompson left you the house and everything in it. Yes, Stephen. You certainly are fortunate. I wish I had your luck. Museum star Jackie Cooper. Listen again soon for another of your favorite motion picture stars in a drama of The Unexpected. This program was transcribed in Hollywood. If you or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, 
There is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline, as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Unit 99 to KMA 907. Unit 99, Sergeant Meredith, 909, in service, on the air. This is Sergeant Dan Meredith of Unit 99 at headquarters, Police Department, City of Sacramento, California. My detail is to ride in Unit 99, our tape recorder equipped radio car, and to respond whenever the dispatcher transmits a signal to one of our other units on duty somewhere in the city. At the scene, we make the recordings which we provide for the broadcasting company for this program. Now, to tell you more about Unit 99, here is our chief, James V. Hicks, Sacramento Police. Unit 99 is a regulation radio patrol unit of the Sacramento Police Department, cruising the streets with a tape recorder. Sergeant Meredith is on duty and works for your protection, as every police officer does. He can and does make arrests. His orders are to respond to the radio call. You go with him, and what you hear is real. Police, criminals, victims, and witnesses are all real. And whether an arrest is made or the subject released, what happens is real. Make no mistake about that. Now to Unit 99 and Sergeant Dan Meredith on duty. Unit 99. 99, go ahead. 924, second floor, 99. Second floor, roger. We've just received a call from the uh, sergeant's office, police headquarters. Don't know what it is right now, but we'll check it when we get in. We're at police headquarters in the basement. There's Morrison and his partner, Devers. Hi, Pete. I got a call to come in, and uh, can you give us a full story on this? Uh, we received a call at 4th and K. King in regards to a man being robbed on the city streets. And he stated he lost a ring, possibly valued at $900. While placing the man into the squad car to bring him to the station for further questioning, a stick of dynamite dropped out of his pocket and landed on the city sidewalk. My partner and I then began searching the man and found another stick of dynamite in his right front pocket. Also, five detonator caps in his right front shirt pocket. Was this dynamite fused? Yes, one one was. <laughs> Where is this fellow now? We have him in custody. You going to talk further with him? We will. Okay, you sit down there. Yeah. What were you going to do with this dynamite? I would go over to Eureka. You going to Eureka with Eureka the dynamite? Eureka, Nevada. For what reason? Well, I, I go over there. We, we got a little hole in the ground over there. See? Now, were you going to use this dynamite for blasting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, do you carry this dynamite? Uh, yeah, that's right. I, 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 some of you guys run around with the guns. You know, I don't. I don't go with the gun. I, I go with this doohickey. I like it. I've yeah, been it all, all my life with it. See, all my life with it. Uh, tonight. When these two men are supposed to jump you on the street. They did. They don't know. They wasn't supposed to. They did. They did. Yeah, yeah. They tore that baby off, you know, and that red beautiful just a stone. And you that you lost the diamond ring. Yeah, yeah, correct? they tore it off. There's a woman seen them take it off. Yeah, we had that woman's name. Yeah, yeah. Where did you get that Kurt. diamond ring? Kurt. Kurt Stone. Where did you get that diamond uh, ring? Over in South Africa. South Africa. You yeah. were in South Africa? Oh, what, what do you mean, boy? All over the world. Yeah. 
Uh, yes, the time when my partner Dever picked you up and put you in the police car, do you know anything about the dynamite being in your pocket at that time? Sure, I have it. I think I have it. What, I, I, a I, miner, or what are you? I mean, what kind of work do you do? Explosive. You mine, huh? That's right. That's yeah. the reason you carry the dynamite? No, because I love it. Do you have any uh, idea of using it in Sacramento for anything? Huh? You, got, you, you just don't understand something. No, uh, I don't know why you carry it in town with you. I, 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 I'm going over to Eureka, Eureka, Nevada. And I wanted to go and get a room. Boy, they grabbed me there and then that's it. You're, you're experienced with dynamite, aren't you? You had a lot of experience with it? Well, you usually carry a fuse like that in your pocket. Isn't that a chance of it going off? No. You no. can't go off? No. No. Well, those detonators are pretty touchy. Don't they go off fairly easy sometimes? Well, take, uh, take the baby out here and take a, a 30 yard six and you can't knock it off. Well, the one that you had fused, if you put that into an electric light socket, would it go off? Or if you had a, if you had a, a flashlight cell, see, uh, set that uh, uh, top and bottom, see, mm -hmm. uh, uh, that'd be positive, see, sure it would go. Yes. How much damage would that stick of dynamite do? Well, it, uh, uh, you'd get kind of sick. Would you say it would blow the uh, size of this room all to pieces? Oh, no. No, no, no. I'll take the baby right over there, and I'll put it right back in there, and I'll sit right here and knock it off. Explosives. Explosives is a, is a science. How long have you been at this? Uh, 40, 50 years. How old a man are you? Uh, uh, 60, 37 years old. Where'd you get the dynamite? Uh, uh, bought it. Where at? Uh, uh, Placerville. How'd you get the dynamite from Placerville down to Sacramento? I had it in my pocket. Oh, well, how'd you get from Placerville to Sacramento? Uh, on a stage. Oh, on a bus? On yeah, a stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you carried I'm that going, dynamite? I, I'm, going, I'm, going to, I'm going to Eureka, see? Mm -hmm. But you carried I wrote, that? I wrote, I wrote the old gal and told her I was coming over there, see? Yeah. You carried that dynamite in your pockets on the yeah, bus sure. to yeah, Sacramento? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then walked the city streets looking for a room with the dynamite in your possession? That's right. Let me tell you something. I, I never run around with a gun, sir. But explosives is my whole life, sir. And I, I, I run around with explosives all my life. And you grew up in the you Placerville. Were, the now, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm going to tell you something. You grew up in the Placerville, and you know, you know, I come down, and I got the, I, I got a lot of gold, see. And Westo and I, we go down and sell this gold. And we're going back up the hill. And the guy won't give me a new bottle, see. So I go over there and I, prohibition? I put, uh, yeah, yeah. And I, I put, a, I put, a, I put a stick of powder in the bar and I put the doohickey in it and, uh, and I light the gadget. And when they all got out, I cut the baby off and I get me the bottle and I went over and sat down. In 1936, you were picked up for vagrancy up in El Dorado County. Also, I never was pinched for a Although Also, at that time, you were charged carrying dynamite at that time, transporting dynamite. Is that correct? In 1936, you were charged with carrying dynamite, according to your report. No, no, no. I stole it. You stole the dynamite in that's 1936, right. yeah, but you had it on your right. possession, yeah. and you were charged with carrying dynamite. Well, Pete Endeavors, what's this man charged on now? Well, we charge him with a felony in possession of dynamite. This man was an old-time miner, a familiar figure in the motherlode country, and obviously well acquainted with explosives, although the presence of a few stick of dynamite in his pocket was sufficient to arouse apprehension, expert testimony at his trial established the fact that the dynamite, in that condition, was comparatively harmless and the charge was dismissed.
progress, two men in a building, 10th and North B, north side of town. Several units are called in on it. We'll respond also. Several units there already. Let's get out. We're going around to the rear of the uh, plant. Captain Ledoux is leading. We have a full view of the front part of the uh, building. The officers are going over. There's two detectives down at the end, Mohanovich and his partner, along with uh, Sergeant Ray Daner. They're inside now. Detective Oaks is also in. The office uh, area of the building is all lighted. It's now pretty well covered by the officers on the inside. There's supposed to be a watchman over here someplace. Yes, Captain. I hope he's all right. The two additional officers just scale the fence. Something going back there, around back there. What's it look like, Fox? You got him back there. You got him back there? Yeah. Were they in the joint? I don't know. I don't, I don't think so. Just working on it. Who uh, got him, uh, Mahanovich? I don't know who the officer, I believe. But was it Rath? Uh, well, there's two motorcycles was, out here. Was Rath and... Uh, yeah, Rath and his partner, they were being watched by that special agent. Huh? Special agent said he'd been watching him for about 15 minutes, waiting for him to make that entry. Oh, the special agent from the SP? I believe it was, yes, Dan. No, they're bringing him out. <laughs> yeah, they'll be bringing him out shortly. Now, here they come. Great, isn't it? Yeah, here they come now, Tiny. There's quite a few officers there, I can see. It appears to be two suspects. Yeah, of course, like procession. <laughs> Several uh, spotlights and flashlights illuminating the area. Yeah. Who'd they say got him? Uh, Rath and his partner? A couple of motorcycle men. Yeah. There are no doubt the first ones here. Sergeant Daner, Detective Oaks, Fox, a special agent from the Southern Pacific, uh, Officer Farnsworth and Raft of the uh, Traffic Division, two young men. You see, they threw a pair of shoes over the fence. One is barefooted. The Farnsworth? You and Rath get this fellow, these fellows? Yes, we, uh, they started to run away just as we got to the back of the building there. They started pulling, talking, we, uh, we drew our guns and told them to holler we'd shoot. And they stopped almost immediately and uh, held up their hands, told them to face the wall, spread their hands and legs apart. We entered over through the fence. Rath, Officer Rath entered through the fence and began to search one of the parties while I covered him. They tried to enter the building. They hadn't actually entered it. They were trying to enter it and they were picking up pieces of metal or something around the, around the back of the building. And uh, they deny trying to enter it. Pick up any tools or anything? I picked, uh, I picked a, uh, a knife uh, and a... Uh, Looks something like a uh, looks like a Jimmy bar. Jimmy tool, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here comes the last suspect over. Yeah. Let's take him in. Yeah, uh, the detectives are going to take him in for questioning. <laughs> putting the suspects in separate interrogation rooms. Rath and Farnsworth, I see you have a 
some uh, properties taken off of these culprits. Well, off of uh, the suspect that I searched, I found a pocket knife and a jimmy tool. And how about your man, uh, Rath? My man had a pair of gloves on, on at the time he was stopped. He had a flashlight in his pocket. He had a pair of wire cutters, diagonals, and a knife in his pocket. He claims that he carries the stuff with him all the time, and uh, the gloves he just happened to have with him to use, and he put them on to climb over the wire fence. Did they both have gloves on? They both had gloves on at the time they were arrested. Let's ask him a couple of questions, huh? Sure. All right. Go on in, Farnsworth. Rath. Okay, we want to ask you a couple of questions here. Uh, uh, what were you doing with this stuff here tonight? We have a pair of gloves and a flashlight and a uh, pair of diagonals and a knife here. What were you doing with I these always, things? I always carry a pair of pliers or these. I had these down in my pocket really at home and working with them. Now on the screen door, see, I just happened to stick them down in my jacket pocket. Of course, the flashlight, a lot of times I go up to the pool hall there. I've only lived about three blocks in the pool hall. I usually just Stick one, you know, and have to walk back home west in the dark. You know, sometimes I go up there and stay for 10, 30, 11 o'clock. Where did you come from before uh, you got to the place you were arrested? From that tavern over here where his car is parked. Mm -hmm. And uh, from there, uh, how did you get over to the place where you were arrested? We went right across the corner there, over there, because that's where I told you we seen the lights. Where did you take the car to? Well, the car sitting there at the tavern. Well, why didn't you take the car with you? Well, what do you think? We'd drive the car up there if it was, would would get out of there. Which they got away anyway on us, if it was. Now I don't know. They might not even be in a bother thing. The guys was walking along there now. How far is the car from the place you were arrested? Well, I couldn't say just exactly just how far. I'd say. Or oh, maybe a quarter, half a quarter of a mile. Now why did you walk over to this place where you were well, arrested? We threw these guys over there, this light, and I told this one guy, I said, there's somebody over there with a light. Mm -hmm. Of course, there's, there's, a, there's a junkyard right over this way, and then the, them cars along in the railroad track. Yes. So we went just run straight across that lot down through there. And so I told him, I said, well, here we'll have to go over this fence. I said, I'm going to slip my gloves on. And then I skint my finger there going over the fence. Uh, we have a uh, statement from the office, other officer there that you were trying to get in the window. Is that true? No, I wasn't up to no window. I was up there by that building on the, by the corner. Yeah. Was That's... your partner trying to get in the window? No, I didn't see him if he was. Absolutely not. Why were you there by the window? Well, that's where we saw those guys went around there, around, around those cars. Why didn't... The best I could see. Why didn't you call a policeman instead of going in there? Well, that's what we should have done, really. That's right. I'll be honest with you. That's what we should have done. Uh, things don't just, just don't add up with all this tools, gloves, and a pair of wire cutters, and a flashlight. They just don't add up. Well, that's whatever you guys think. That's, I, you know, told you my best. Why don't you tell us the right story now? That's right. That's why, don't you tell us, you. why don't you tell us what you expected? I didn't, I didn't touch a window on that building, however, myself at all. What did you hope to find in there? I didn't even expect to go down and find anything, because I didn't go down and find anything. Didn't you climb the fence? Yeah, we went over the fence. And, go, and then we didn't know the other fence is on the other side, see? Didn't you know that was a violation of the law? Uh, yes, Trespassing? I knew that. I knew that. Yes, sir. I sure did. Where do you work? I haven't worked too much this winter at all. When's the last time you worked? Well, during the cannon uh, season, it made us at Burkhart and Richards. Then I had... Uh, one little job with some guy up there in Gardenland, a building, uh, one of those block, concrete block buildings. Then I worked for over here for, with, him, with him on the same job, building a room on a patio for a guy way over here in uh, Fruit Ridge. All right. When's, well, how do you maintain yourself uh, from day to day if you're not working steadily? Well, I'm usually there at home and I work at the pool hall. You can check at the pool hall there and find out I'm out there pretty good every day at the pool hall. What do you do at the pool hall? Well, I play a little pool once in a while. Once in a while, just sit around. Actually, what do you do? What do you do for uh, maintaining yourself? What I mean, as far as uh, the financial, you mean? Is that what yes, you mean? Your... Well, my wife, she she works, and only every few nickels I give, she gives them to me. Or the girl I watch sometimes off her. She works over here in town. 
Uh, have you got any money on you now? No, I haven't. Mm, where did, you, did you expect to find some money tonight? No, no, no. I wasn't, wasn't even looking for any money. Mm. What were you doing when you first observed these two fellows going over the fences you saved? Well, that's when I told this boy. I said, there's somebody going. Where were you at that time? Well, we was up there just getting out of the car. Out where? By the, by the tavern there. By the tavern. Yeah, we stand out by the car. Mm -hmm. A quarter of a mile away. Well, it was, I, I don't know whether it's a quarter or not, maybe not it's quite. It's more than a quarter. Well, whatever it is, quarter. You have pretty good eyesight over there where it's all dark. Well, uh, of course, nice you guys can see a flashlight in the, you know, a light. Yeah. See, that's how, otherwise, if you had a light or anything, you couldn't see them, no. Well, no. you're... No, you couldn't see Your him. partner tells us a different story in here. Well, whatever he tells you, that's, now that's, that's the way, way I saw that, it. That's he I tells saw. us a different story. Well, whatever he tells you. I just know what he said at all. Uh, after all, you, all this trouble you got to get over the wire fence, what happened to the other two fellows that you saw in there in the first place? Well, that's uh, really honest to be with you. I don't think he was in that lot now. I think they was over the fence by the railroad tracks. So you don't think they were there at all? Yes, I was, I was seeing, seeing the light there. Yeah. Did you see anybody? Yeah. That's you true. saw a person in there? No, no. Now, they weren't in that. I wouldn't say it was in the pen at all. In that tent, you know, they could be on the outside, just as well as the light. But it was there was a light over there. That's when I saw it, and it was it's like he was carrying a light in her flashlight. Farnsworth, is there a discrepancy in the stories of the two fellows? Yes, uh, one fellow states that uh, they were driving by the driver of the car. States that they were driving by when they noticed two fellows going over the fence. Now this is uh, a discrepancy against the story of the second man, which states that they were a quarter of a mile away or so when they saw, getting out of the car, saw these two fellows going over the fence or saw the flashlights. Mm -hmm. uh, what are they going to be booked on? We're going to book them on charge of burglary and uh, the detectives will follow up. During his career, a police officer hears many stories and alibis. But the story told by the burglar suspect, whose arrest you cover tonight, was completely implausible. In addition, his friend told a conflicting story. As a matter of fact, both were lying, and subsequent questioning brought out the admission that they planned to break into the place. They also admitted other burglaries and were held to answer. This is Unit 99 in Sacramento, California. These on-the-scene tape recordings were provided by the Sacramento Police Department and were made on duty by Sergeant Dan Meredith in Unit 99. Your host is Chief James V. Hicks of the Sacramento Police Department. Be with us when once again you will hear... KMA 907, Sacramento Police. Unit 99, are you in the clear? Unit 99 to KMA 907. Unit 99, Sergeant Meredith, 909, in service, on the air. just heard an authentic police action as reported by Sergeant Dan Meredith in Unit 99 in service on the air. Next week at this same time, another on-the-spot tape recorded event presented in cooperation with the Sacramento Police Department by the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service.
When Mike left his latest trucking student at the terminal, he knew that Dave was not truly gone. The smell would take a lot longer to get out of his truck's cabin. What Mike didn't know, though, is that the odor wasn't the only thing that Dave left behind. Bedbugs by Jason R. Davis, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. Unsolved Mysteries Down the ages, man has been seeking the answer to the riddle, what happens in the unseen realm beyond. With all our science, we're as far from answering that question as man was in the beginning. But with the accumulated records of the past, the conviction is borne strongly upon some that there is a link joining us mortals with those who have passed this way before. <laughs> enjoying their after-dinner coffee and cigars. The log fire casts a ruddy glow over the room, and the soft candlelight throws grotesque shadow shapes on the walls and ceiling as the guests settle themselves more comfortably in their chairs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but seriously, Bert, while that was a good story, well told you. You don't really believe in ghosts. Now, well, before I answer that question, let me ask you one. Go ahead. Mm, do you completely, wholly, and absolutely disbelieve in them? Oh, when you put it that way, I'm not sure that I can answer you, Bert. <laughs> I suppose in their heart of hearts, most men, while they won't admit it, do have a secret belief in ghosts or something similar. Well, what do you say, Jackson? You're a newspaper man of wide experience. Have you ever run into what you might call a true ghost story in your newspaper work? Yes, I have. An experience of my own, and one, in fact, to which I owe my life. Exactly, Jackson. It was that experience of yours that I had in mind. What is that, Jackson? Something we haven't heard about? I don't tell it to many people. But you will tell it to us. Why don't you, Jackson? It's going to be published next month anyway. All right. As you fellows know, I was foreign correspondent for the Sketch Mirror Group. And one of my assignments was to interview celebrities before they became celebrities. Well, I had to make a quick trip to England. It looked very much as if the Asquith government was about to fall and that Lloyd George would be in the saddle. So I had to interview Lloyd George before the news broke. I concluded my interview and was all ready to leave when I met an old friend. He had become a lord since I first knew him, but that made no difference to him. And the result was that I found myself in their Northumberland home, being greeted by her ladyship and her very charming daughter. Cheerio there, Major. Hello, sir. I want you to both meet a very old friend of mine, Jackson. Well, not the Mr. Jackson. The very first. I'm so glad to meet you, Mr. Jackson. Keith has spoken of you so much. And I'm delighted to meet Keith's mother and sister. Oh, come, Evelyn, dear. We mustn't keep Mr. Jackson standing in the cold. We shan't want the carriage any more tonight, Dom. Uh, very good, sir. All right. 
Fax will take your cabs up. Come right through the hall and get your bones thrown out. <laughs> Thanks, old man. It is a bit silly, huh? Riding up to the house here in the carriage is an experience to one accustomed to riding in a closed car. We don't use the car much up here, and tonight Arthur has it down in the village, getting in some supplies. <laughs> it was charming, even if silly. But then this open fire makes up for all the coal. Drink that to the flank, yes. Yeah. Stay then. Ah. Thanks. Oh, yes, how? Oh, did you boys have dinner tonight? Thank you, we did, on the train. And by the way, I take back all I've ever thought or said about dinners on an English train. That was one of the best meals I ever had. <laughs> Possibly you were more hungry than usual. There's something I must say. Even if all the books ever written on etiquette say that it's contrary to good taste. Oh, what is that, Mr. Jackson? I'm sure we'll forgive you. Your home. It is without question the most beautiful place I've ever seen. Why, when we were driving up the hill, it looked like some picture out of a children's storybook. A picture of an old medieval castle. The drawbridge, the portcullis, the moat, the tower, and the turrets. It is somewhat of the medieval castle. The north wing was built in the days of Henry II. And each generation since has added this little bit. And we, well, we added electric lights and plumbing. The plumbing was the devout approval of the family... The electric lights against my mo own most ardent objection. <laughs> <laughs> well, with electric lights and plumbing, I can't think of anything more to be desired. We even have one of the best ghosts in all England. Yes? My <laughs> ghost is... You might at least give a chap time to warm his feet before you drag out the family skeleton. Our ghost is not a skeleton. You shouldn't say things like that. <laughs> you must forgive Evelyn, Mr. Jackson. But maybe Evelyn's ghost is a... Well, almost an obsession with Evelyn. Well, I'm sure that if Lady Evelyn's ghost is half as charming as you are, Miss Evelyn, then she's a ghost I'd like very much to meet. <laughs> oh, thank you. Let's go to the gallery and show Mr. Jackson Lady Evelyn's portrait. No, no, my dear. I'd be delighted, really, if it isn't too much trouble. No trouble at all, Jackson. In fact, we're all tired. Since the gallery's on the way to the bedroom... Come along, Mr. Jackson. You come with me. You see, Mr. Jackson... Lady Evelyn's ghost is a very special ghost. She always warns us of any impending disaster. And do you always heed her warning? We do now. And she warned Mother about Father. Father paid no attention. He was killed. Just as the ghost warned Mother he would be. Is that the only instance? Oh, no. It's a family tradition dating back several hundred years. Here's the gallery. I'll switch on the light. Mm, no need to tell me which one. There she is. Yes. Why? Hey, it could be a portrait of you. I say, old man, don't pay too much attention to what Evelyn tells you about the family skeleton, you know. Keith is quite right, Mr. Jackson. Evelyn is unduly enthusiastic. <laughs> She's not any more enthusiastic than I am. I'm enjoying the whole thing immensely. Fact is, I'd rather like to meet this ghost, uh, Lady Evelyn. Then, then why don't you sleep in the haunted wing? No, oh, my dear, my dear. Yes, yeah, by Jove. Invite a fellow up here, and the first time you want to stick him in the haunted wing. But Jackson did sleep in the haunted wing. The wind howled dismally among the turrets and along the roof leads. The oak paneled walls creaked as night wore on and the cold became more intense. One by one, the sounds in the old castle died away. And soon Jackson fell into a sound sleep. He wakened with a feeling that someone was in the room. Sat up in the big four-poster bed. A woman stood against the far wall. Uh, Miss Evelyn, dressed in old-fashioned clothes, playing the part of the ghost. But the figure shook its head, turned a pair of luminous eyes on him, and started to write on the wall. For a moment, the warning message blazed out in letters of fire. Jackson closed his eyes and, and looked again. A trick. She's writing with phosphorus or something. Again, the figure shook its head. Gave him a searching look that went right through him, and turning, walked out of the room through the three-foot stone wall. Hi, George. Eight o'clock. I didn't realize I was taking so long to tell this story. We'll be late for the theater. Oh, hang the theater. Finish the story. Yeah, sure. sure. Well, I did my best to disregard the ghost warning. His lordship drove me to the boat. I could say he tried to, but the car broke down. I missed the boat. And two days later, Keith, with a face as white as a sheet, handed me the morning paper. In glaring headlines, I read, Steamship Titanic Sunk, All on Board Lost. The 
thought that was an exaggeration. But I might have been one of the more than thousand who were lost. Good Lord. What did the warning that was written on the wall say? Beware of the Titanic. Nothing more. I told her ladyship next morning, and she was the one who instructed the chauffeur when she found I was determined to sail. She instructed him to break the car, if necessary, to prevent my sailing on the Titanic. Now, do you fellows believe in ghosts? Imagination is not Jackson, old boy. We're glad you missed the Titanic. And we're darn glad you're here to be our host at this dinner party. Now, we've got time for one toast and off to the theater. Out of deference to people who are still alive, character names in these unsolved mysteries have been changed. Inasmuch as any solution must of necessity be supposition, liberties of time, place, and character exist in the solution that will be presented after you have heard from your sponsor. Gentlemen, the solution for which you've been waiting. Of course, I don't blame you for believing in ghosts after an experience like that. But just the same, you can't really explain it. I think I can. I'd like to hear you. Have you ever met a perfect stranger and had the strange sensation of having met him somewhere before? Yes, certainly. Well, the same thing applies to buildings. And the older these buildings are, the more vibration of previous happenings there will be to make their effect upon you. You mean to say that if I go into a building where a murder has been committed, I'll be aware of a strange feeling? You will, if you're sufficiently sensitive. I'll agree there, but that doesn't explain actually seeing what is generally called a ghost. If you've ever tried lying down in perfect ease and comfort, allowing your imagination to drift back to some particularly memorable scene, the picture will come to you as vividly as if it had happened yesterday. Or take an author writing a story. The characters are just as real in his mind as any group of living people about whom he's only read. I'll agree to all that. Very well. Don't you think that if, over a period of centuries, people living in a certain house are all agreed that the ghost of a beautiful woman haunts the house, don't you think that that impression will impress itself very strongly upon a stranger who sleeps in the so-called haunted room? Yes, I think that's perfectly reasonable. I really do think that if a sufficient number of people all think along one line, something is going to result. And, of course, you were thinking of your trip on the Titanic as well as the ghost. So you're willing to admit that concentrated thinking will produce a manifestation. And if that's the case, why deny that an extremely emotional incident would produce a similar manifestation? Hey, there's something to that, isn't there? Yeah, you've got me almost convinced. But just the same, I'll have a stronger belief in ghosts when I meet one face to face. Well, if I ever meet a ghost, I hope it will be like the ghost of the Lady Evelyn. One that will have such good intentions bred in it that even if I'm a stranger, it will warn me of any impending disaster. Of course, the ghost of Lady Evelyn would have warned anyone who had been in the room whether or not they had had any intention of sailing on the Titanic. That part of it, I think, is coincidence. Do you? <laughs>
I've often joked about how instead of an energy drink, I need a motivation drink. They just don't exist, or so I thought. I was told recently about Magic Mind. They wanted me to consider promoting their product, but I never endorse anything unless I've tried it and approve of it first. After taking Magic Mind with my morning routine every day, along with my vitamins and my coffee as always, in less than a week, I was feeling more focused, more alert, and surprisingly, more motivated. I'm spending more time on what's important and getting more accomplished when doing so. My mood is better, making each day less stressful. Magic Mind is doctors validated. It has over 200 scientific studies behind each of the ingredients, like Cognizine Cytosoline, it's the best nootropics on the market, the highest possible grade matcha, organically grown mushrooms from California, and more. Magic Mind uses nano encapsulation technology. It helps your body to absorb the good stuff that much faster and more efficiently. So, I gave them my stamp of approval. I even signed up for a monthly subscription of 30 bottles before telling them I approved. And now Magic Mind is giving you, my weirdo family, a special deal. Up to 48% off your first subscription or 20% off one-time purchase with the code DARKNESS at checkout. Go to magicmind.com slash darkness and then use the code DARKNESS at checkout. Over the minds of mortal men come many shadows. Shadows of greed and hate, jealousy and fear. Darkness is the absence of light. So, in the sudden shadows which fog the minds of men and women are to be found the strange impulses which urge them on to their venture in the dark. And now, for tonight's venture in the dark, we bring you Mr. Charles Barrett in Eclipse. Tell me, Mr. Police Commissioner, how long ago did life begin for you? Forty, forty-five years ago? Well, life for me began about 24 hours ago. Yeah, 24 hours ago, I woke up. I was lying in a ditch beside a railroad track. When I first opened my eyes, I saw the sky. It was clear and very blue. I sat up and saw that my knee was sticking out through a hole in my pants, that all my clothes were dirty and torn. I started thinking, wait a minute, what's happened to me? I rubbed my eyes like you do when you first wake up. My hand ran across something sticky. I looked at my hand. Blood. Yeah, dry, sticky blood. I figured I must have fallen off a train i been thrown off. I got up. Then this bum started walking up to me. I could see him quite a way off. Hey there, young fella. Yeah? You hurt? No, I'm all right. Well, what's the matter? Nothing, huh? I'm all right. Dizzy, I guess. You've been kind of banged around. Yeah, I guess I have. I, I better rest a bit. Sure, Pete, sure. That, that, that's the idea. Uh, what happened? Get bumped off the rods? I, I don't know. Well, how'd you be in the ditch if you wasn't bumped off the rods, huh? I don't know, I tell you. Okay, Pete, okay. My name isn't Pete. Oh, well, I just call everybody that. Um, what is your name? My name is... Well, uh, my name... Well? I can't, I can't remember my name. You can't... You can't remember? Are you kidding? What are you trying to pull? Don't even know your own name. I tell you, it's true. I don't know. I can't remember. It's not so easy to forget your own name, Pete. Look, don't ride me. Something's happened to me. I don't know just what, but something's wrong. I, I... Well, where are you from? What? Where are you from? I don't know that either. Well, uh, 
What are you trying to get away with, Joe? You can let me in on it. I won't spill. I'm not trying to get away with anything. I just can't think. I, I just can't remember. It's crazy. Hey, you really got it bad, ain't you, Joe? Well, let me, let me see. I was... I was... No, it's no use. Hey, look in your pockets. Maybe you'll find something with your name on it. Yeah, maybe. I never thought of that. At least it's a chance. Yeah. But, uh... What's wrong now? There's nothing in my pockets. They're empty. You're in bad shape. You don't know who you are, where you're from, and you ain't got nothing in your pockets. Uh, where you heading? I can't remember. Well, if I was you, the first thing I'd do is try to find out who I am. That's, that's kind of important. Yeah. Well, I seen the train pass through, the train you fell off of, and I don't know where it was headed for, but I do know where it started out from. Where? Chicago. Chicago? Yeah. Now, the thing for you to do is head right back to Chicago and start asking questions. And, oh, maybe, maybe you better pay a little visit to the hospital and have them look at your beam. Now, Pete, you don't look so good to me. Mm-mm. You don't look good at all. Yes, Mr. Commissioner, that's how it started, with loss of memory, amnesia. That was bad enough. But if I'd known how much bigger and more terrible my problems were going to be, I never would have come back to Chicago. Anyway, I hitchhiked in. When I saw how people were looking at my torn clothes, I thought I'd better pay a visit to a tailor. Good afternoon. Come in. Thank you. I, I'm... Such a beautiful day. I don't feel like working already, but when it's got to be, it's got to be. What can I do for you? Well, my clothes... Such a mess. You had an accident, eh? Yeah, I'm afraid I did. What's the matter with me? Sit down, sit down. You look terrible. <laughs> you could use a little drink, some brandy maybe? No, thanks. I feel okay now. I'd just like to have these clothes sewn up and pressed a little. Could you do it while I wait? I think I am with pleasure. Look, go into the back room and throw your clothes through the door. You'll find the wash basin. You can wash that cut on your face. That's very kind of you. There's only one thing. Yes? I'm flat broke. I couldn't pay you for them now. Maybe in a day or so. All right, a day or so, a week or so. Go and make yourself at home. And while you're washing up, I'll mend the pants. I'll get him in first class shape. So I went into the tailor's little back room and took off my suit. Then I went over to the washstand and started to wash. <sighs> my head felt better as soon as I got a little cool water on it. I sat down. I tried to figure, what would I do? Where would I go from here? Then I noticed something about my pants belt. It was bulky. had a little zipper in back. When I opened it, money started falling out in tight rolls. Bills were crisp and new. I thought my heart was beating loud enough for the tailor to hear it as I counted the money. There was $50,000. Hey, mister, how are you coming with the clothes? Huh? Oh, oh yeah, they're ready. I'll, ha- I'll hand them to you through the door. Good. I'll have them fixed up like new in no time. You sit there and relax. You look like you can stand it. Yeah, relax. Relax with 50000 bucks strapped around my stomach. Well, the little tailor fixed my clothes and I looked fairly respectable again. You know, I never seen such nice material in a long time as that suit. Is that so? Yes, it cost a beautiful dollar, believe me. Where did you get it? Where did... Well, wasn't there a label on it? No, the label had been ripped off. So why am I asking so many questions? <laughs> Goodbye and good luck. What do I owe you? So when you earn a few dollars, come back and we'll figure it out, eh? Well, let's do it. About $20? But before you said you were broke. This I don't understand. That makes two of us, my friend. You can imagine how I felt, can't you, Mr. Commissioner? I didn't know what to do, where to turn. I thought of going to the police, but something in my subconscious mind warned me against it. When I looked fairly respectable again, I went out on the street and began walking. I didn't know where I was going or why. 50,000 bucks. I tried with every ounce of strength to crash through the wall that separated me from my past. Oh, it was no use. I must have walked for miles. Because suddenly it was dark. I was on a dismal little side street lined with hock shops, hamburger joints, and honky-tonks. 
And then some punk kid brushed against me. Hey, mister. What? You better fade fast. What? You're being tailed. What do you mean? A guy's been following you for the last hour. Following me? Relax. Don't get so jumpy. Boy, you must really be hot. Now, look into this window. You can see his reflection. The tall, skinny guy in the white suit. I see him. How do you know he's been following me? Because I've been walking a little behind you ever since you turned down 14th Street. And I can tell when a guy's being tailed. Why are you telling me then? Because maybe you'll be a big-hearted guy and slip me a bill for it. And because maybe I don't like cops. Cops? Sure, sure, he's a cop. I can tell him a mile away. Yeah, you must really be hot, mister. It's easy to say now that I know what I should have done, Mr. Commissioner. I should have gone up to this guy and had a showdown right then and there. But panic is a funny thing. It begins almost before you know it, and there's no cure for it. No cure at all. I began hurrying as fast as I could. And I didn't stop until my wind gave out and my legs weighed a ton. And I looked back. I'd lost my friend in the white suit. But for how long? I had to find a place to sleep that night. I saw this little hotel on a side street. Straightened my tie. Wiped the sweat off my face. Started through the lobby. There was no one at the desk. I rang the desk bell. A little fellow with glasses came out. Yeah? I'd like a room. Great, sir. A dollar and a half in advance. That's all right. No luggage, huh? No, I... Just staying overnight. <laughs> That's all right. Very few of them bring any luggage. <clears throat> What's your name? Huh? <laughs> Just want your name for the hotel registers, huh? My name... My name is Bronson. Uh, Howard Bronson. Howard Bronson. I thought for a minute you were going to say you were one of the Smith boys. <laughs> Here's the key, Mr. Bronson. Okay. Now for the dollar and a half. Yeah, here. Twenty dollars? Is that the smallest you have? That's all I have. All right, I suppose I can change it. You sure it's good? Didn't make it yourself now, did you? It's good. <laughs> oh, no offense. Just my own little joke. Okay. <laughs> take another nickel out for this newspaper. Sure thing, sure thing. And here's your change. <clears throat> now, why don't you go up to bed? You look very tired. I tried to sleep, but it was no use. Why had that man in the white suit followed me? What had I done? Not knowing. Not knowing almost drove me out of my mind. Out of my mind. I was already out of my mind. And finally I must have dozed off. Because I was suddenly in the middle of a terrible nightmare. No. No, I won't give it up. I won't stay there. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. Leave me alone! Bailey! Bailey! I won't. Mr. Bronson? I won't. I won't. Mr. Bronson? What? Are you all right, Mr. Bronson? Yeah. Yes, I'm all right. Who is it? The room clerk. Would you open the door for a minute? Yeah. Come in. Several of the guests heard you screaming. We wondered. There's nothing, just a nightmare, I guess. I'm all right now, I think. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. Is that all you wanted to know? Not exactly. Well? A detective came in a while ago inquiring about somebody. Detective? Yeah, city detective. That is according to the badge you showed me. What did he want? No one named Bronson. Then why are you bothering me for it? It wasn't Bronson he asked for, but uh, his description of the man fitted you exactly. How long ago was he here? Oh, about 20 minutes ago. Your name is Bronson, isn't it? Yeah, sure. You know it's technically against the law to register under a name. My name's Bronson. Okay. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure, that's all. You must have wanted somebody else. <clears throat> Says he's been checking up on all the hotels in this neighborhood. 
Says he might drop back later. What did he look like? Oh, tall fella, kind of slim, wearing a white summer suit. White summer suit? Yeah. You don't see many of those nowadays, do you? No. <laughs> yeah, you sure you're over your nightmare? Huh? Yeah, I'm all right now. Okay, then. Good night, Mr. Bunch. Good night. Oh, say. Yeah? That fella does come back. The uh, detective? Yeah, the detective. If he does come back, let me know. I just want both him and you to make sure I'm not the one he's looking for. Okay, Mr. Branson. <laughs> you in there. After that, I didn't want to sleep. I got very jittery. I paced the room. I smoked one cigarette after another. Why had I said that to the clerk? I couldn't be so lily white with that 50 grand strapped to me. Still, maybe it would be better to have it out with the guy once and for all. Finally, I forced myself to sit down. I picked up the paper and started to read. The front page was filled with news of a war I couldn't even recall and names that meant nothing to the shadow that had engulfed my mind. But down in the corner of the front page, what was this? A detective slain on train. Detective slain on train. George Bailey, Chicago Detective Bailey. The man in my nightmare was found dead this morning in a roomette on a westbound train. Police officials report that he was on the trail of one Joe Latterly, who was believed to have killed the detective during an attempted arrest. Police throughout the state are on the lookout for Latterly now. He is known to be carrying $50,000 in stolen currency. $50,000 in stolen currency. <laughs> Now, what was I going to do? I was not only a thief, I was a killer. But funny thing, somehow I didn't feel like a killer. I didn't feel like a killer at all. Mr. Bronson? Say, that detective came back. He's here with me now. He'd like to talk to you. Detect? Oh, yeah, sure. Be glad to talk to him. Uh, wait just a second, though. I'll, I'll throw some clothes on. No, thank you. I wasn't having any of this. The only thing I could think about was to get away. I rushed to the window, raised it. A fire escape led right down to a back alley. Open up, Mr. Benson. I slid over the sill and started down the fire escape. As I raced down the steps, I heard excited voices there above me. Goes. And then... They were shooting at me. This was a new sensation, Mr. Commissioner, and not exactly the most pleasant feeling in the world. Well, that convinced me. I was a killer. A killer at bay. <laughs> What could I do? Where could I go? It was almost midnight. There was not one person in the world that I could turn to. That I knew. Oh, I didn't even know my own name. I didn't... Wait a minute. Wait a minute, yes. Yes, I did know my own name. Joe Latterly, the newspaper said. Joe Latterly. I saw an all-night drugstore down the block. I closed myself in the phone booth there. Started thumbing through the directory. Sure enough, there it was, Joe Latterly. I wrote down my address and began dialing my telephone number. And while the number rang, I felt a cold sweat come rolling down my face and neck, soaked into my collar. Hello. Hello. Is this the Latterly residence? Yeah. Yeah, what do you want? This is Joe. Joe? Yeah. It don't sound like you. I had a little accident. You get the money? Yeah. Any trouble? I killed him. Oh. Look, I better see you right away. Yeah, but don't come here. The cops are thick as flies. You better meet me at the usual place. The usual place? Yeah, yeah, at Mom's. Okay, at Mom's. Oh, hey, look. This accident kind of must up my memory. What's Mom's address again? 229. 229? 9th Street, apartment 204. 204, okay, I'll see you there. Gee, you sure sound funny, Joe. What happened? I'll tell you about it when I see you. So I had a wife, and she was in on everything. 
You see, Commissioner, the jigsaw puzzle was beginning to make some sense. A wife. I couldn't even remember the color of her hair. If only I could break through the shadow. Ten minutes later, I was standing in the entrance of a very classy apartment hotel lobby. Not a soul in sight. As I began looking down the list of numbers for the right doorbell to ring, I felt myself going shaky again. There it was, 204. I pushed the bell. I waited. Then the door buzzer sounded. I pushed open the door and started across the lobby. No one in sight. No one. That was a break. I pulled my hat down over my eyes as I started up the steps. See, I was beginning to think like a hunted man, like a killer. I took the stairs to the second floor. I started down the hall. Two hundred. Two hundred and two. The next door, 204. The door was ajar. I wanted to call my wife, but what was her name? Honey? Honey, are you there? No answer. I pushed the door open. The room was in darkness. I felt along the wall for a light switch. Found it. And there, waiting for me, was this detective. The tall, skinny guy in the white suit. I let my nerves take over. I jumped from the room, slammed the door shut, and started running again. But this time he had a better chance at me than before. As I hurried through the empty streets, I could hear him coming right behind me. I ducked down alleys and across backyards. He was right on my tail. I couldn't run much further. I was all pooped out. Then I bumped smack into somebody. Uh, hey! Uh, watch where you're going. I didn't see you, officer. Well, I'm not exactly an officer. I'm a night watchman. But who are you running from? Why, why, nobody. Nobody at all. I looked up and down the dark street. The detective was nowhere in sight. Well, I don't know. You weren't exactly strolling along. Come over here to the street light. Let me take a look at you. Hmm. Well, you must know I... I got in a little jam with a lady. I, oh, well... Oh, oh, so that's it. The way you run, I bet you're a hard man to catch. <laughs> yeah. Well, get on with you and be more careful next time. You may not always get a head start. <laughs> I guess that's right. Good night to you. Oh. Yeah? I... I live on the other side of town. What's the quickest way to get home? Yeah, there's an elevated train station two blocks from here. That's your best bet. Okay. You better hurry, though. The last train pulls in at one o'clock, and it's pretty close to that right now. I'll hurry. Night. I began walking again. Once I got away from this neighborhood, I'd have a chance. A chance for what? I wasn't sure. But a man with 50,000 bucks could do a lot of maneuvering. I saw the lights of the elevated station ahead, and in the quiet night, I heard the rumble of the approaching train, the last train. I started jogging. I couldn't miss that train. Hey, wait up, you! I took a quick glance over my shoulder. It was him again, my friend in the white suit. I raced up the steps three at a time. When I got to the top, he was at the bottom. Stop, or I'll kill you! I'd never heard a deadlier sound than that voice. The last train was just pulling in. The detective was coming up the stairs, kind of slow. For some reason, I didn't have time to figure out. The train stopped. The doors swung open. I got in. The doors closed, and the train was on its way. I looked back. The detective was standing on the platform just looking at the train. I didn't get it. Why hadn't he come after me? I couldn't figure it. Then I decided I'd better get some information from the conductor. Say, can you help me? Yeah, sure. What do you want to know? Where's this train go? 63rd Street. 63rd Street, huh? Can I get the state highway from there? No, you're going the opposite way. That kind of mixed up my directions, huh? Well, the only way to get where you're going is to take another car back to the loop. Thanks. That was what I wanted to know. I decided to get off in a block or two in case the cop was waiting for me at 63rd. He must have figured he could beat me there. He'd probably have quite a little reception committee waiting. So I got up, started to walk to the door. Hey. Yeah? Where are you going? Well, you said I was going the wrong way. I'm going to get off at the next stop. Uh, you can't get off till 63rd Street. This is an express. I 
I was just about ready to crack. I knew it'd be curtains for me as soon as I got off the train. I kept hoping for a miracle. Maybe the train would crack up or stop one station too soon or... Oh, no. Oh, it was no use. Finally, the conductor called the station. 63rd Street, 63rd. And the half dozen sleepy passengers started getting up and heading for the doors. Then I got an idea. Maybe I could stay in the car. Maybe I could wait. When the last passenger got out, the conductor looked over at me. Uh, this is where you transfer back to the loop. Uh, where does the train go? Up a few blocks, and we turn around and head back. Well, couldn't I go back with you? Ah, uh, sorry. You got to get out here and cross the bridge. Oh, but I don't see any harm. I hard. don't make the rules, buddy. The company makes them for me. Well, I tell you, I'm just going hey! to... Hey! What's the matter? There's somebody behind you. Just come with me. I got a gun right against your back. It was him. I felt the gun rubbing against my spine. I knew I had only one chance. So I whipped around. I was lucky. I caught him with a hard right and he went down. I jumped fast and got his service revolver. He didn't stay down long, though. As he got up and lunged at me, I let him have it. Right between the eyes. So there's my story, Mr. Police Commissioner. I'm Joe Latterly. I killed two cops. One today, one last week. I stole 50,000 bucks. I'm tired of the whole thing. I'm glad it's over. It's quite a story, mister. I don't suppose you remember how or why Detective Bailey was killed last week on that train out of Chicago? No. Well, we reconstructed the crime pretty well, we think... Began a week ago when a fellow named Steve Roycroft came to headquarters with a complaint against one of his employees whom he suspected of embezzling $50,000. And that employee was... Joe Latterly. I see. Latterly had disappeared and Detective Murphy was assigned to the case. Later that day, he found Latterly taking the morning train out of Chicago. He called Roycroft and told him about it. Both Roycroft and Murphy made the train on Latterly's trail. They confronted him and got back the 50 grand. Who got the money back? The man it rightfully belonged to, Steve Roycroft. Well, where did I... Just a minute, just a minute. Roycroft got his money back, but Latterly made another try. Mm. He overpowered Murphy and killed him. He would have killed Roycroft, too, but Roycroft jumped for his life from the speeding train. Wait a minute, wait a minute, you got it wrong. I jumped from the train, remember? Exactly. But you just You're said... You're not Joe Latterly, my friend. You are Steve Roycroft. When you got your money and jumped from the train, you lost your memory. Then when you read that we were looking for the killer, Latterly, you naturally assumed that you were him. Of course, we thought Latterly still had the money. Good heavens. What's the matter now? Don't you realize what I've done? What? Well, thinking I was Joe Latterly, I killed the detective who was trying to bring me in. Detective? Yes, just now, on the elevated platform. Oh, but that wasn't a detective at all. But then who... He was Joe Latterly trying to get back his money. Or should I say, your money. Joe Latterly. That's right. And there won't be any charges. You killed him in self-defense. Yes, it was Joe Latterly all the time. That's why you met him in that apartment. It was his hideout. <sighs> I know this has been a great shock to you, Mr. Rycroft. Shock, yeah. You're not well. You need rest. I've sent for an ambulance to take you to the hospital. A psychiatrist there will be able to help you recover the balance of your memory. I hope so. I hope they can make me forget what I, what I thought I was. How do you mean? I've lived the life of Joe Latterly too well. It's done something to me. I'd begun to think like he must have thought. Like a hunted killer. It's not going to be easy to return to the commonplace, routine existence of this Steve Roycroft after what I've been through. Oh, I, uh, 
I hope I won't become too bored, Mr. Commissioner. Next week, at the same time over most of these stations, we'll bring you another original story about the land of the shadows. The story of two killers and of retribution out of the forgotten past. Join us then to examine at first hand the strange impulses which urge human beings into their dark venture. Eclipse was written by Larry Marcus and Robert Light and featured Charles Barrett as Steve Roycroft. Original music by Dean Fossler. This is ABC, the American Broadcasting Company. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. You can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio